Voyage of the Honor Bound by Anjali Sailor Anderson Read by Stanley Anderson Man that is in honor and understandeth not is like the beasts that perish. Psalm 49, verse 20 Part 2. Honor Lost An island far away to the west and south. It is not down on any map. True places never are. Herman Melville, Moby Dick Chapter 11. The Children of Kyalari In the beginning Kyalari created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the spirit of Kyalari moved upon the face of the waters, and Kyalari made the light, and sundered the waters above the firmament from the waters below, and Kyalari caused dry land to appear in the midst of seas, and she filled the earth and the water and the air with living wonders, both growing things and beasts. And she formed her children out of the dust of the ground, and breathed into their nostrils her own breath. And Kyalare planted a garden southward and westward encircled by the ocean. And there her children took root downward into her foundations of rock, and turned their eyes upward to her holy stars. And upon the island within the underground sanctuary she brought forth the fountain of life. And this was the manner of the island, that at its fashioning Kyalare divided it into four parts, the greater part was to north and eastward, a rainforest where vines and tendrils twined webs to snare the fragrance of orchids of every size and hue, where the colossal bulks of banyan trees were shrines around which danced the slenderer trees that fruited and flowered. There grew also the greatest banyan, whose shadow waxed and waned with the shadows of the moon, and there in the forest grew the purple blossoms of the taboo. There the children of Kyalari had their houses and their place of feasting, and there they gathered to themselves food and found friends among the beasts. There along the westward shore the goddess sculpted the rocks of hearing, and there she carved a bottomless bathing pool whose source was the fountain. In the island's lagoon, bordered by the forest all but at its southern end, swam the messenger of the water, keeping the eternal vigilance of Kyalare. To the southeast, cradling the lagoon underneath, was a land of hills and streams, the hills rising in height as they strode inland and culminating in the Polly's barrier of fluted cliffs. In the midst of the Polly were three soaring peaks, the central peak the most lofty. The ground at its summit was hallowed by Kyalare, and from it toppled a waterfall to feed a small lake, which split to form a host of streams running among the green hills to the white sands. From its inward face the Polly fell sheer and unscalable, so that the land of streams could be approached solely from the sea. South and west lay a drier, starker land, visited by the children in ones or twos when they desired solitude. Golden thistles stood tall amid a myriad waving grasses, and rugged trees whose cousins sojourned on African plains grew there sparsely, bowed in posture by the constant wind. Occasional palms studded the rocky shores, and in the black rocks were holes through which the sea spouted suddenly at times. Amid this wild land, overgrown by red angel's trumpets and orange honeysuckle, was a great cone from which a coil of smoke ascended without ceasing, a sign that the inner fires of earth had worked together with its creature coals in shaping the island. In the cone dwelt another of Kyalari's messengers, flaming gold in color, and of a form unknown. Northwest was the sacred peninsula, dedicated wholly to the goddess. Along it southward stretched an impassable precipice, and the isthmus connecting it to the rainforest was barred also by a thick wall of rock, the gap between precipice and wall, and the stairs beyond leading to the cavern of the fountain, were reached by crossing the narrow water between the isthmus and the rocks of hearing when the tide was low, for when the waves ran high they were too perilous to permit swimming. There was a second access to the peninsula through a tunnel in the rock wall, but the door of the tunnel was known only to the oracles. That longer way to the waters passed through a land they alone among the children were permitted to behold the northern beach where Kyalari had sown the seeds of the most heavenly of her flowers, the strange twilight of the west where ran her herds of horses, the sighing trees that lined the entrance to her sanctuary. Past the trees there was a grotto where her daughters gave birth in slings suspended between giant ferns. Past the grotto, back eastward and deeper underground, was her sanctuary's largest chamber, in which those men and women who were meant to abide as one were bound in marriage and in which, in an alcove apart, they joined first in the flesh. 
further east and deeper yet, within a cavern perfumed by night-blooming Sirius, and aglow with the light of life, there welled the fountain wherein the children at their births were overflowed by the spirit of the goddess. And this was the manner of the children. They were gold, amber, olive, or russet of skin, lithe and strong of limb, and goodly of countenance. The most of them were black of eye and hair, but for a few whose eyes were azure and whose hair was pale brown. And though a few of them were delicate, the greater part were large of bone and tall. They ran and dove and swam and aimed the bow well, and they made a beauteous, haunting music with their voices and with their flutes and drums. They rose early and stayed abroad late. They donned and doffed their little clothing in the open air. They took pleasure in their work and in their play and in their prayer, in the anointing of their bodies with fragrant oils, in telling of tales. When, after many centuries, the souls of them flew heavenward with the ebbing of the tide, the remains were borne to the lagoon on a floating bier, then accompanied by seven swimmers to the beach in the reef, and given burial beyond it in the bosom of the sea. And this was the manner of their language, that it was the language of all the earth at that time, though the children were cut off from Kyalari's other offspring by wilderness of water. And this was the manner of their governing. Kyalari herself served as their queen. She spoke to them sometimes within the secret places of their own hearts, and sometimes through their oracles, one man or one woman in every generation, who possessed skill to discern what the rocks of hearing murmured without surcease. And this was the manner of their marrying. At the age of fifteen, a man would search the heart of Kyalari for she that is meant, and, finding a woman of thirteen for whom the goddess had chosen him, would enter with her into the sanctuary. There they would don wedding garments, not worn again, but preserved as sacred things and the man would take a band of white cloth and cast it around the woman, keeping the one end of it twined in his hand, and he would say, Till death I bind thee to myself, as I myself am bound to Kyalari. And they would go together into the alcove where the marriage was to be consummated, while the remainder of the children kept vigil by the light of night lamps until the dawn. Then the wedded ones would return to the rainforest and the hut prepared for them. And such was their manner of bearing child, that when a woman's time was nigh, at ebb tide she would cross over alone to the cavern of the fountain, where she had been baptized at her own bearing, and passing through it and back through the chamber of her wedding and mating, she would come to the fern grotto. Cradled there in a netted sling among the sheltered coolness, she would fall into a state of dream while Kyalari drew the child from her without the aid of midwife. When she awoke, she would carry the child to the fountain, where her husband would meet her and immerse the child in the water thrice once for health, once for age-long life, and once for union with the spirit of Kyalari. And this was the manner of the children's worship, that though they sought to the banyan for the secret of her power, and to the cone for the secret of her purpose, to the poly for the secret of her beauty, and to the sanctuary for her joy, yet they worshipped the goddess with their every breathing back to her, of her ensouling breath, in every place, in company or alone, bound to her by and through all things that be." and in that binding was their power and purpose, their beauty and their joy. And they lived in peace until the ninth generation from the first man, formed by Kyalari in another garden far to the east, whence flowed four rivers. In that generation there was born among the children a boy named Turo, and a girl named Rani, a boy named Kela, and a girl named Lare. And Turo and Kela attained their fifteenth year from their immersing in the fountain. Chapter 12. Out of the Dust Now the scorpion was more subtle than any beast of the field which Kyalari had made. It lived beneath the upthrust rocks that scarred the lonely wilderness of the south, and ventured forth at evening to feed on creatures of delicate limbs, sensitive antennae, and ephemeral wings, and to dance its dance of death. Such was its manner of courtship. The male would lock pincers with his female, and would execute a dance which was also a battle, till at last, having proven his supremacy, he would drag her away to mate with her. Herein lay the scorpion's subtlety, that in the pattern of his existence, death and life, love and hate, were woven too nearly to be disjoined. Only the scorpion among the island's fauna was venomous, inflicting lethal sickness with the needle-sharp sting at the end of its curved and jointed tail. Why Kyalari had fashioned such a creature was not revealed to her children, but it happened that, as one among them every generation was chosen as oracle, so one was chosen to surrender his longevity to this unnatural end. 
The baptism of the fountain preserved the children from illness and extended to centuries their span of years, but its waters did nothing to prevent death by mischance or by the design of men. No murder had been done, and no accident befallen but for the once-in-an-age sting of the scorpion. The poison of the sting would cause a man's throat to constrict, would make him salivate and sweat uncontrollably, overcome by nausea and pain, his skin would turn blue, his limbs go numb, and he would breathe no more. Kayla, at the age of six, had watched a man of his father's years die so, and had never ceased to brood upon what he saw. With that same morbid fascination which was a blending of horror and pleasure, he now studied a scorpion of greater length than his own long foot as it crawled from the shadow of its rock and made its tracks in thirsty dust about the base of the cone, hunting meat to replenish its venom, stalking a partner for its deathly dance. Men came to the wild land to ponder the goddess's purposes, to pluck understanding from the solitude of their souls. They returned to the northern forest, having found what they sought, but for once in a generation when they found the sting and returned to die. Kayla also had come here to ponder, though he, among all the children of his age, appeared to have least cause for unrest. Head and shoulders above the next tallest he stood, his body most powerful and his features the noblest. Every woman looked on him with admiration and every man with respect, and his two brothers, Maku, his senior, and Pohe, his junior, all but worshipped him for the breadth and depth of his mind. He was expected to be a great one among his people, and to wed with the most excellent of Kailare's daughters. Many thought it his destiny to be his generation's oracle, though none might know certainly till the spirit of the fountain burst from the chosen one in a sudden flood not to be mistaken. This was wont to transpire when the oracles reached their season of marrying, Kayla had looked to feel the spirit burst forth from himself, but as he attained maturity, it had unsealed its wellspring instead in a girl of thirteen. Thinking upon this now as he watched the scorpion's grotesque ritual of self-perpetuation, he felt bitterness which ran deeper than the only hurt of being passed over for his race's highest calling. For with the ripening of his manhood, the time had come for him to seek the wisdom of Kailari for she that is meant, for the identity of her that was to be bone of his bones and flesh of his flesh, Fervently he had sought, and had not been pleased with what he had found. Among the girls born two years after him, the one to whom he had been drawn, even as a child, was Rani, so easy to lead and so eager to give pleasure, so desiring to be possessed and to lose her own heart in that of the possessor. Though all women among the children were beautiful, there was none whose beauty had enchanted him so much as hers. He loved to play hour long with the luxurious tangles of her tresses, to run his fingertips along the outline of her sweetly pouting lips and along the curling ends of her dark lashes, and to see her face reflected in the ebony mirrors of her eyes. As the womanhood of she and her sisters had flowered, it was hers that had blossomed most perfectly, so that there was not a filament's breadth of her that he could wish to be otherwise. Though the glances of other boys becoming men fell upon her with delight, and most particularly those of his friend Turo, Kayla knew that his eyes unveiled in Ronnie what no other saw and by this he was sure that when he that is meant was revealed to her, the name that burned within her would be his. He had looked within himself to find Ronnie's name burned, and look as he might till his soul went blind he could not discover it, but found the unhealable searing of an alien name instead. He had felt a sense of injury in being rejected as oracle, yet he had not been so bold even in the secret alcoves of his thought to ascribe blame to his creator. Now his thoughts terrified him even while they wooed that blaming, for now the injury was driven more deep. For the unhealable name was the name of the oracle, the one accepted instead of he, the name of Lare. What few thoughts of her had been permitted by Ronnie's reign in him had been good. He had taken some pleasure and even a gleaming of joy in exchanging words with her quick spirit, and had acknowledged that her beauty in its own way was not less than Ronnie's. She had never given him cause for wrath, though he had felt discomfort when her brilliance ascended too nearly to the meridian of his own. Her unique eyes, intense in blueness as the waters of life, had not repelled him, but had at rare moments seemed to seize him from visions of his own consequence and return his focus to the source from which his being fed. Those moments had ceased since she was revealed as oracle, but still the eyes had been neutral to him and not reservoirs of pain. And then there had come the moment when he had seen them gazing at him from inside his heart. It was then that he had begun to hate them, for the power they had once had on him, for being other in color than the eyes of Ronnie, whom he loved, and for being more favored of Kailari than his own. The hate made him afraid, 
as he had feared from a child when he had found dislike in himself toward things that made other men glad, the screeching of the birds as they heralded the sunset, the mist that rose from the earth at whiles to water the soil, the southern wind that blew without rest, the music of the fountain intruding itself gently upon the privacy of his dreams. The hate made him afraid. He could not face it as evidence of his lack, and could only judge it otherwise as his strength. With all the strength that was his, he hated the waters that had not chosen him, and the eyes that had. Others among the children had for a season inclined wrongly in desire. Being enlightened, they had shifted that desire to the one appointed by Kailari. He, Kayla, was not as other men. Other men had, their own sight failing them, sought to the oracle for the vision of their chosen mates. Turo sought to Lari that very morning, and had received the vision he had longed for, the image of Rani. He, Kayla, would not seek to Lari, for he already knew what words the rocks speaking through her would hear. The same words her eyes said silently to him when they looked at him with love, he that is meant. He hated her love, and hated also Turo, whom till today he had loved as his own soul. He smelled the smell of night-blooming Sirius, reminder of the fountain's invasion of his sleep. It bade him quench his dark drought in water's light, forgo the sovereignty of his nature for his and his people's greater good. But out of the shadow of a brooding moment the scorpion within him crept, and inflicted its poison upon the holy beams of the moon. Rani was his heart's life, and was bestowed upon Turo by will of Kailari. By the will of Kailari, Kayla knew, with exquisite horror, whom he hated most deeply of all. Lost in interior caverns, he was startled by that knowledge to sudden awareness of what was about him. He froze with dread to see the scorpion dancing within an inch of him, its stinger swaying just shy of his flesh. Was her hatred for him as deep as his for her, and had she therefore branded him as his generation's sacrifice to untimely death? But the scorpion moved no nearer, and Kayla wondered at why the creature danced alone and did not seek a mate. Then it seemed to him that an answer came, but like all answers now it was one he could not make his own. For it seemed to him that the scorpion's pincers lifted themselves out of the dust to offer homage to him and receive his homage, that it was his hands for which they sought, himself with whom they yearned to dance. Flinging to the wind a curse of terror and rage, Kayla ran forestward through the star-blind night, his eyes stinging with the last tears he was to shed. Beneath the all-seeing noon sun, Ronnie bathed in the forest pool whose waters bubbled cool by day and steamed by night. The eyes of her flesh lighted delicately and impermanently as moths upon the sultry colors of leaves and blooms, and abode in northwestern caverns, in the sanctuary of Kailari, where she would soon be wed with Turo. She imagined in every detail their journey to that holy place, their garments of wedding, and the ritual of the cloth by which Turo would bind her to him till death. She imagined walking in embracement with him to the lover's alcove while the children kept vigil, imagined a night of splendid knowing, in whose hours, if the goddess willed, their firstborn would be conceived. She saw the hut they would inhabit, where it would be situated, how she would appoint it. The birth of her children, and perhaps of theirs, passed before her and quickened her with gladness, but she stopped short of imagining hers or Turo's mortal end. She need not hurry to conquer her dread of that disillusion, though two hundred years hence she might pause to think on it again. She was single-visioned in anticipating her future, yet at whiles it intruded into her mind to think it strange that thus and thus only would it be. Till yesterday at this time, when Turo had come to her with Lare's answer and she had consented to the truth of it, her thoughts had ever been brimming with no one but Kayla. Kayla was her girlhood playmate, and she had given her heart to him from the beginning. Though she loved the goddess as well as her nature allowed, reverence for the boy she loved came more easily to her. There was none so wise nor fair among the children of Kayla, and he, wondrous to Ronnie in light of her own simplicity, had believed that she was the one chosen for him, and had caused her almost to believe the same. So when Turo had brought her word of what the rocks of hearing had relayed by their oracle, it had shaken her, but she had begun, with the passion that was hers, to unseat Kayla from the throne of her hopes and crown Turo as king. She dreamt of Turo, but Kayla swelled into her dreams at times like a troubled wave. She wondered if he, for all his superior strength, would find it so easy as she to set a new course upon the sea of his young life. He had the will to sway himself and others, but his will ran wayward from the tracks of more common men. 
Ronnie did not know towards whom Kayla's will must now learn to steer, though she guessed that it might be towards the most illustrious of her sex among the children, the oracle, Laurie. And truly such a match would be right and good, and Ronnie rejoiced for Kayla, even as she breathed an anxious prayer for him. So ardent was her prayer that it seemed to her that in her spirit she saw Kayla standing at the head of the pool stair gazing down on her. Then the light dimmed from gold to deep gray, and fear took Ronnie of bright portents, shutting and sealing their lids and winking out like dead worlds. Of the goddess's back turned toward her petition. The form of Kayla darkened with the darkening of the sky, and Ronnie sensed suddenly that he stood there in truth. Her heart leapt with greeting for an instant only before plunging into despair. For as the eclipsing moon glided beyond the sun, gilding the light again as he emerged from shadow to descend the stairs, his reflection in her eyes was disfigured past reshaping. She knew before he spoke for what he had come to her. His body indomitable as his will, she knew that there could be no deliverance for her unless other men of strength among the children were roused from their scattered midday leisure and sleep. Now he was but a hand's breath away from her. She opened her lips to cry out, but the muscles of her throat constricted, and her heart forbade her, saying, No, but this is Kayla whom I love. He stopped just short of touching her, staring into her eyes, and the eyes that stared were not the eyes he knew, but were fay where they had once been fair, wanton where they had been wise. Ronnie, he whispered deep in his throat, and his voice seemed to her to be clawing its way surfaceward from under fathoms of water. Finding her own voice at last, Ronnie pleaded, Kayla, no. To reinforce her words in a feeble attempt at protection, she raised her arms as a barrier between them. Kayla's eyes followed her arms upward to her hands and riveted there, seeing her yet seeing something else. Yes, I will dance with you, yes. He wove his fingers inextricably with hers. Upraised hands to upraised hands, slowly they circled, grappling together. Dust, Kayla chanted huskily, and again, dust. It was then that Ronnie recognized what in the chambers of his imagery he was seeing and imitating. The battle of the scorpion, the dance of death. Tears poured down her olive cheeks for this death of the friend she had loved. She wished for her own death even while fearing it, rather than that his love for her had brought him to this. Around them were waters less only in felicity than those of the fountain, but his lips against her were dry and cracked like bones stripped by desert heat of their flesh. His eyes did not focus on her, but crawled past her toward the cleft in the pool's edge, bored into it to discover its secret, and smiled. Ronnie ceased to struggle, her heart shrinking to a barren seed. Even as Kayla made her his against the claims of honor and sanctity, her thoughts drifted back to her vision of her wedding with Turo and begged to remain there. But the voice gritting in her ears would not suffer her, but reminded her still, and still, I am Kayla, and you are mine. No wedding in the sanctuary for Ronnie, no child to immerse in the blessing of the waters. Poisoned now and forever, she saw the sacrifice of her generation to the scorpion's sting, and it was she. Morning broke in, despite of souls clinging to the refuge of the dark. Yet Laurie lingered at the rocks of hearing where she had passed the night in listening until their voices held no meaning for her. It was but a week since they had graven in her the name of he that is meant, and had prophesied to her that a child springing from her would behold strange lands and days and would move the hearts of men beyond her dreams. The rocks had named Kayla, and though she had not yet spoken to him and had seen no confirmation in his eyes, she knew that his deep delving vision must reveal to him the same. The rocks had shown her Kayla and had shown her a child. The rocks could not be wrong. Was it then she who had erred in hearing them? Far rather would she have believed this, though it impugned her own standing as oracle, then believed that what she had witnessed yesternoon from the cleft of the pool had been an act of intended defiance toward the goddess. Far rather would she believe in her own blindness than to believe what her own eyes had seen. Kayla spying of her as he forced his will on Ronnie and his delight in the slaying of both their hearts. Consummation of those unions decreed by Kayalari had as a rarity taken place before the rite of the cloth and otherwhere than in the sanctuary, and this weakness of impatience had been forgiven and not punished. But that a man should spurn her choice and take to himself the mate of another, such a deed had no precedent, and must surely draw down the goddess's wrath. Kyalari must judge, and she, Lare, though bound by decree to the doer of the deed, must pronounce that judgment. What it would be she did not yet know. Perhaps if Kayla repented, surrendered Ronnie to Turo, and accepted Lare to himself. But Lare, 
spirit meshed with Kayla, even in his sin, knew that this would not be. She herself then must, centuries hereafter, die mateless and childless. Yet the rocks had shown her a child. The rocks could not be wrong. To the rocks, hewn of crystal-veined white limestone in which the forms of shells and corals were embedded, her eyes were turned. But she sensed the approach from behind her of a great company of the children. As they stepped from the forest eaves to the shore where the rocks stood sentinel, she turned to face them. They were divided into two bands. Seeing this, Lari's heart foretold her of a sundering among her people, beginning here and enduring beyond her capacity to see an end. Approaching from her right was the larger band with Turo at its head. His haggard face disclosed to Lari that he had spent the night in agony even as she. Approaching from her left was a band of four. Kayla, his features set in hard rebellion. His brothers Maku and Pohi, fiercely defensive yet unsure. And, held and holding tightly to Kayla's arm, Ronnie weeping. It was Turo who spoke first, bowing to Lari in respect of her office. Oracle of the Holy Goddess, he began, his voice ragged with pain and controlled anger. With Kyalare and these among her children as my witness, I come to you for judgment. Will you hear my complaint? Her voice quivered so that she could hardly trust it to carry her words. But Lare answered, I know your complaint, Turo. It is also my own. Turo seemed not at once to understand her. Then, perceiving the ravages in her face that were twin to his, he glared toward Kayla with increased outrage. To Lari he said gently, Forgive me, Lari, for the necessity of adding to your injury, but only you can interpret the speech of the rocks, and teach me and all those still faithful to Kaya Lari what she would have us do. Will you beseech the rocks to make her desire known? I will beseech them, briefly turning the bottomless sorrow of her eyes' blueness upon Kayla and their infinite pity upon Rani. Lari faced the rocks and pressed her body close against them. Her arms spread wide as in an embrace. Her eyes closed, and soon there ran through her a quaking, and the murmuring of the rocks grew louder, till the company of the children could dimly hear words, though they could not understand. The murmuring grew quicker, and intermingled with it, quickening too, was the murmur of the fountain. At last the murmuring quieted and slowed, and Lari, still trembling, yet mantled visibly with authority, turned back to the children. Now hear the judgment of the rocks, and of their mistress upon Kela, son of Korah. Kayla, leaving Ronnie in the grasp of his brother Pohe, stepped forward. He did not bow to Lare, but held his head high, challenging her with his eyes. Before you pronounce judgment upon me, I would speak. You have leave. Had I leave of you or no, yet I would speak the same. From the hour of my first memory I have loved Ronnie and she me. From our first years we knew that one day we would wed and make children for the pleasure of Kaya Lare. And now the season has come for us to wed, and Kaya Lare, through you, her mouthpiece, has bound each of us to another. That bond I will not bear. As Kyalari has not been pleased to consider our love, it no longer pleases me to consider her pleasure. I spit upon it, and upon you, her oracle, to whom she would have yoked me. Rather than wed with you, Lari, I would choose to live mateless and without seed. If to wed with you is to know the joy of her waters, then I will go dry. If you are the fountain and Rani the dust, then the dust is my own." Kayla's eyes sought to scale Lari's and conquer them. He scrabbled at the still blue surfaces, lost foothold, and fell away. While that look lasted, Lari resigned herself finally to the loss of him and all they might together have been and wrought. Then she said, Kaya Lari at your making raised you out of the dust and pointed your eyes heavenward to the pursuit of her glory. If your will is set so, you may descend to the dust again. She turned to Rani. Is it your desire to remain bound to this man now that he has taken you? Ronnie did not speak, but only wept soundlessly, and in her silence Lari read the only answer her too yielding love for Kayla could have borne to give. Then here, Turo, and all the children, pronounced Lari, her voice growing vast with the spirit speaking through her. The judgment of the goddess upon Kayla. She hesitated, seeing the guilty anticipation of harsh justice on Turo's face. Would he understand the sentence of the rocks and surrender to it, or accuse her of being false in her hearing? She herself had expected wholly another answer, but she knew that she was not deceived. As Kayla has despised the judgment of his maker, so Kyalari speaks. Kayla shall make his own judgment. There was an intense pause, during which the eyes of the children filled with surprise and perplexity. 
Turo clenched his fists but choked. The will of the goddesses declared before he withdrew. Kayla smiled. I thank you, Lare, Kayalare's oracle. My judgment is as I have said, to seek my own pleasure and no longer that of the goddess. If she like it not, let her execute her sentence upon me by her own hands and not the hands of men. He turned in ceremonious triumph and with Ronnie and his brothers left the rocks, the other children following uneasily in their wake. Lara remained looking after him. It is as you have said, she whispered at last, and only she among her people conceived how dreadful was that self-named doom. And yet shall you have this to answer for before her. You will not suffer her wrath alone. The next morning at dawn, when the tide was at ebb, Turo made his way solitarily to the Rocks of Hearing and the place of the crossing. Kyalari had put into his mind what he must do, and Lara had confirmed him in that purpose. As it was the will of the goddess that he be mateless and without child, he would go alone to the sacred peninsula and its sanctuary and there bind himself to her, to live in dedication to her only, as Lara also must live. The sun rising from the lagoon over the rainforest shone upon the water of the crossing and illuminated the gap in the cliff barrier of the north shore, beyond which were the stairs that entered the ground to find the cavern of the fountain. The fountain and its fashioner bade him to an unearthly marriage. He put forth one foot into the water, and then another, never deserting the gap with his eyes, never hearing the transient sounds of stirring bodily life, but only the fountain's life perpetual. So it was that he did not hear Kayla entering the crossing behind him, Turo came to the midway mark between shore and shore and went no farther, for the arms of a once friend, stronger now in hatred than they had been in love, went around him and pressed him down till the waist-high waters reached to his chest, his shoulders, his throat, and the nostrils from which he drew breath. Enemy arms bore Turo down under the waters, out of sight, so that the enemy's eyes must no longer see Turo's eyes accusing him, loving his mate. So Kayla left Turo beneath the water of the crossing, and the violent waves of the incoming tide performed his unction, and the tide's next ebb drew him tenderly out to sea. Following behind Kayla as he returned to shore, there spread a plague visible as the waters changing from blue to black. Though Kayla glanced back once to ensure himself of Turo's death, he did not see, for his spirit was far away to the south, where pincers, which now seemed hands to him, reached out of the dust, to take his hands. Chapter 13 The Violent Earth So the waters of the crossing were cursed for Kayla's sake, and by them the way to the fountain of life was guarded from the children as by cherubim and flaming sword. So a woman became a snare to a man as her first mother had done before her, and a man was betrayed by the seducer of Eden, older than time. An insurrection against the goddess's pleasure widened from one man outward like rippled on the surface of a pool when a hurled stone troubles it. For it came to pass that when certain men among the children saw that Kayla cleaved to a woman not meant and remained unpunished, then those whose natural loves had already led their hearts astray followed where their hearts led and took by force the objects of their desire under the mountain apple trees by day and beneath the Magellanic clouds by night, forsaking the right of the cloth to hallow their unions and in the course of months sons and daughters began to be born of those breachers of troth. Forty weeks after Kayla's tryst with the scorpion, sunrise erupted golden heat upon he and his companions in the place of jubilation. With his brothers Maku and Pohi, and his friends in rebellion, he had spent the darkness in feasting and dance, until his blood burned and his limbs ached with celebration, while close by through the rainforest, Ronnie labored within their hut to bring forth his first scion. Kayla had prepared a bed of sweet fern for her to lie on. He would not permit her to journey to the grotto of Kyalari where birth among the children had ever taken place. With his decision to please the goddess no longer, he had determined also to abandon all her rites and customs, and his heir would be born free of her yoke. In exultant anticipation of that liberated seed, he had passed the uncommonly hot night in which stars seemed not to tremble softly as they were used, but to pulse with sharp, uncompromising light in which shadows across the moon stirred impatiently to mirror the agitated branches of the banyan. The banyan where he spied it above the crests of the smaller trees seemed to dance with him, riding wave currents of unbridled air, though there was no breeze to ease the sultry dark or the suffocating illumination that came after. No bird screeched, no pig grunted, no dog barked, 
The only sounds but for the orgiastic drums and cries of the feasters were the cries of Ronnie in her travail. Her labor was perhaps made harder by birthing in a manner other than the one appointed, but Kayla counted a tithe's increased pain worth the liberty of what it bore. Now in the ardent exhaustion of the windless dawn he waited for the last cry, and soon he heard it, and into the ensuing silence flooded the first cry of his child. Then he and his companions performed a final leap in triumph, and drank one draught more, the infants crying, abiding all the time. Kayla dropped to the mossy earth, sweat glistening on his handsome brown skin, his eyes afire with pride. The mist that rose to water the morning ground cooled him, yet even amid his joy he remembered to hate it. Would that the water would fall rather than rise as she has ordained it. Would that the shrieking birds would be drowned by it and scream no more. Strange that no bird had yet wakened to desecrate the quiet. He reveled in soundlessness, then became aware that his child had ceased to cry. It sleeps, he thought happily, or it suckles at her breast. At the instant of his so thinking, the quiet was torn asunder. A scream which he recognized as Ronnie sliced through it and was smothered by silence again. Kayla tensed, but for a moment did not otherwise move. Then he bolted to his feet, his brothers following in his tracks and attempting to restrain his speed against the agony to come. He plowed through the intervening trees till he reached the hut he shared with Ronnie where she lay. All but one of the women that had attended at the birth stood apart from her and wept, and the one remaining at her side fled from her before Kayla's face. Kayla took his own place beside her, leaned over her and stroked her damp hair. Her eyes were open, tearless, and staring vacantly. Ronnie, he whispered in love, too strong for enduring. Ronnie! Her eyes turned to him, and tears began quietly to fall. Kayla's eyes traced their path downward to find what lay like the weight of mountains ground to dust against her breast. His memory cast up the words of Lare. Kayla shall make his own judgment and his challenge. If she like it not, let her execute her sentence upon me by her own hands. She will pay, he groaned, and a wail ascended from him to wound the children wherever within the forest they waked and Lari heard it also and mourned where she walked in the secret way to the sanctuary. The weight upon Rani's breast was a baby boy, Kiru, son of Kela, son of Korah, and he was dead. Four sons and daughters more died within an hour of their birth before the children understood the consequence of seeking to turn aside the purpose of nature's maker. It might be thought that those bereaved would then have repented of their mismating, Yet in their bitterness they cared only for their dead babes, and for the death still to come. Then, at ebb tide, they would have crossed over where the corpse of Turo had rendered the ocean black to tap the healing virtue of the fountain's water. But the first who attempted the crossing was stricken with festering sores that never closed, and the second lost power of hearing and speech, and the third walked not again. So the curse of forty weeks' age was discovered. No offspring of revolt might live but that it be brought to the fountain, and the crossing to the fountain might no longer be forded. Then a lamentation went up from the children of Kyalari, both rebel and faithful, until one among them, perhaps Kayla himself, remembered that to the oracles was known a passage to the sanctuary that not through waters but through earth. It was Kayla whom the children sent to speak with Lare. He searched long for her and found her at last upon the hallowed summit of the Pali. She stood at the brink of the waterfall, looking down to the lake below, the spray flying upward to wet her. Kayla touched her arm, and she turned to him in surprise that any among the children should seek her out, for they had shied away from her in awe or dread since the plague of deaths and maimings. That it was Kayla himself who sought her tempered her surprise with pain. At his touch she flinched, but not with revulsion or fear. Kayla drew back his hand quickly, repelled by the memory of her eyes' old enthrallment of him. He stood a little away from her, and spoke with calm control, despite his bitterness and chafing for revenge, for the life of the whole legacy of his flesh depended on his words and how she answered them. I speak to you, Lare, oracle of the goddess, with the voices of all my people. Lare smiled a little, haughtily, he thought. They are not your people, Kayla, neither do you speak for all of them. And I would rather that you spoke to me with your own voice, if it is not forever lost." Kayla's eyes hardened. If it was thus she meant to deal with him, then he must wet his wit to her level of sharpness. 
Do not mock me, Lari, for my grief and urgency will not endure it. My voice, which you desire to hear, is not lost, but it is you who are deafened. If it were not so, the weeping of childless mothers would have blunted your hard spirit before now and persuaded it to give counsel to their sorrow. I have given counsels that you know nothing of, Lari began, but Kayla brushed her reply aside. Listen to it, Lari. Hear the weeping as it rises to a heaven not inhabited, as it gropes to a sanctuary of no deity and anoints its sorrow vainly in waters whose virtue lies only in themselves. Children are dying, Lari. One died today at dawn as my own died but a few dawns ago. What sin had they committed in your eyes? None, Kayla. But we are one within the current of her spirit, and none can swim against it but that all are sullied and dragged down. Sin reaches beyond itself to take hold of the innocent and strangles their joy also. And that is a part of its tragedy, but whether it be the greatest part I do not know. What perfect justice and priceless wisdom you ascribe to your mistress. May I be pardoned that my eyes are blinded to it. Her justice, I see, will not allow you to prevent more weeping yet, but perhaps your own pity may move you to stay the tide of tears. By that pity, Lari, however buried within your thwarted womanhood it be, show us the way to the fountain that our babes might live who have done no wrong. Lari moaned and covered her face for a time with her hands. When she had mastered herself, she said with gentle pleading, O oh, Kayla, by the wisdom you once fathomed well as I, and by the office of oracle you hope to fill, you among all the children know best that I cannot. The passage through the rock and across the northern beach in the land of twilight is forbidden, and has ever been so to any but her chosen. And Kailari has not revealed it to me that it is her will now to change that forbidding. I am sorry for the dead, and for those that mourn them, I am sorry for you, Kayla, most of all, though I know that you will not believe me. And I beg you to understand this. If you defy her will to find the sacred way, it will bring you no joy. Kayla's eyes wish death upon her. Then our children must die. They must die and be clasped eternally in the bosom of Kailari. There is no happier fate. There will be rebellion, Lari. Those who have been against me will turn to my cause for the sake of the babes. Those who will turn will turn, and those who are steadfast so remain. And if we should torture you to induce you to show the way, then I would answer the same. Kayla thought for a moment to sneer at this high estimate of her courage, but by the power of her eyes' blueness that once had conquered him, he knew that she judged herself aright. He knew also that further entreaty would be in vain. Unless a stronger power than hers could be solicited, all those lovers upon whom her judgment had frowned must remain barren to atone for her barrenness, till the germ of emancipation be rooted out and slavery reclaim the whole harvest of hearts. Words alone could have no force upon her but to sting, and sting he would, for was that not his right of defense as a self-determined man? Beware my vengeance, Lari. Beware lest I bind you to the banyan and rape you. Beware lest I cast you from this summit to the waters below. Beware lest, with a scorpion suckling at your breast as your only progeny, I lower you into the violence of the cone to burn alive. Tears stood in Lari's eyes, but her voice remained even. I fear none of these ends, Kayla, except it be the first. And even so, it would have been better if, forty weeks past, you had raped me rather than the mother of your dead child. Kayla raised his hand to strike her, but refrained. There are other powers than those of Kyalari, as the scorpion has taught me, and I shall call them forth. I shall bid them curse the blue face of the sky and blot it out. You have cursed it already, Kayla. Can you not tell by your hatred that it has already gone dark? Only the whisper of the spray and the roar of the falling waters answered her, for he had gone. The next time he came near her she did not see him, but only felt his presence. It was the third evening after their encounter at the Polly. Having completed her wanted round of banyan, rocks of hearing, and pool, Lari slipped into the secret door and serenely but swiftly made her way to the sanctuary, through the spirit gateways of the sacred peninsula, tunnel of earth, blue of flower, formations of weird shape and color haunted by mystic horses whose allegiance to the boundaries of the world was not as man's. She felt, though she did not hear Kayla slip in behind her, and, divining why he followed, she sensed it as he shadowed her along a circuitous route of visions he was not meant to see. She continued on in all ways as though she felt him not, 
and it was only after she had come to the chamber of the sanctuary where she should have wed with him, and there fallen on her knees to worship, that he made himself known. Turn to me, Laurie. His voice was close at her back. Laurie remained as she was, facing toward the cavern of the fountain and away from him. I will not turn to you, Kayla. My eyes look toward the goddess, and yours away from her, and never will they meet again. She heard how his implacable purpose was briefly tempered by a dying note of the love that might have been. Turn, Laurie. I would not strike you down from behind. Laurie felt him intimately nearer. She thrilled to the resonance of the thing he held in his hand. Though I am an oracle and you are not, yet might you have run far before me. Of the tragedies of your crippled spirit, that is the greatest. The next is that what you would not do, you will do none the less. She lifted her head high, bearing fully the golden line of her neck. Do what you have come for, Kayla, before time itself overtake you. There was a motion behind her, and for a lingering instant she was aware of his legs bracing her back, and his right hand resting almost tenderly upon the curve of her shoulder. Then she closed her eyes, so as not to see his left hand as that drew his knife across her throat. Now hear, my brothers, what came to pass when I had killed the false oracle, hater of our children. My joy in opening her throat with my knife was great, even as great as the joy of spending my seed in her that I love even as great as the goddess's treachery. When I had done, I let her slip to the ground to watch the scarlet blood drain from her, and I thought within myself how that by the running of that blood into the dust of the running waters of our health and continuance were loosed for our taking once more. But the wiles of Kyalari and the enmity of her sorcery are deep, brothers, deeper than I had understood. For it came to pass as I watched the blood run, breathing hard in the satisfaction of my murder lust, that a thing issued from the cavern of the fountain that caused my flesh to crawl. It nearly unmanned me, my brothers. My legs trembled so that I nearly could not stand. In color it was the very blue of the oracle's eyes, and it moved slowly but with ill purpose from the cavern into the chamber of wedding to where she lay dead at my feet. I closed my eyes, thinking to drive it off as an illusion, but when I opened them it came yet on. It was... How can I tell you what it was, brothers? For will you not verily deem that I am mad? It was water, water that flew, mingled with evil light. It floated upon the air to the oracle, and it passed into her through the opening of her throat from which the blood had gone. So it flowed until it was no more to be seen, but the eyes of my spirit could see it glowing still vilely from within her. Then I knew that she was not dead, that though she had been dead she would soon come awake, possessed by the thing that had entered her, the thing that had sealed up the wound of my knife and left a scar that appeared already centuries old. It was the spirit of Kyalari, brothers, that unnatural water. I backed away, staring at the body of the oracle that was dead, and yet was not, and my horror was deeper than the horror of the nightland where the jealous wraiths scrape the departed with shells until they are stripped of flesh. When I came to the threshold between the chamber and the grotto of birth, I began to run, and never ceased until I had reached the rainforest and gathered you to this council, to which you now give ear. The horses of the twilight land, who vanish and appear again at will from our dimension of being, sought to trample me, for they knew what I had done and would wreak the revenge of their mistress. The spiked stones of the beach of blue flowers impeded me and cut me in many places, as you now see, and yet I did not cease to run." And all the while that I ran, I set my mind to contemplate, and the acts that are now my intent were revealed more clearly to me with every fall of my foot, with my every oath at the stone's wounding of me, with every heaving of my lungs for breath. For though the oracle yet lives to guard the way to the fountain, and the cursed spirit of Kyalari lives in her, so the spirit of the scorpion lives in me, for I have danced with him, O my brothers. With his aid we will wrest the fountain of her prison of rock to our own command and use. There are powers not hers beneath the earth, upon the air, within the water, and in the fire, the powers of those that inhabit the nightland of Po. There will be violence, brothers, the violence of bonds broken and sweet travailing, when the island is born anew into our dominion and the waters are set free. Pohe struggled through billows of foliage, breasting leaves and fronds of copper and sea green, diving to avoid strangling vines, flailing to swim above the surface of the drowsiness that eased his eyelids down. The banyan was at his back, the veil of flowers was before him, 
and languorous odors of its blossoms preceding it aroused his senses even as they deadened his powers of thought. This dual invitation to bodily pleasure and abandonment of reason made him uneasy, the more so because his mind was already in doubt. Though his brother was surely the most judicious among the children, yet Kayla's new hatch design was too daring for Poe's timid heart to take joy in it. He worshipped Kayla, and so obeying his behests, even against his own halting attempts at judgment, Yet there was a part of him that wished that all might be as it had been before the rebellion, a part that wished to seek the rocks of hearing to find a woman and to wed with her in the sanctuary, and to baptize his our old children in the fountain of Kailari, whom Kayla now called accursed. That part was the weaker of him, and so he battled toward the veil to fulfill the will of Kayla, though he doubted, though he was afraid. There will be violence in the earth, Maku, Pohi, Kayla had said. It will run the sacred peninsula from west to east that the bondage of life might be released and its waters burst forth. There are powers we have not yet seen that wait to do our will, the spirits of night, Poe dwellers, whom the scorpion bids us free that we ourselves might be free indeed and forever. Kailari has killed our children, and we shall kill her spirit by drowning it in the spirits of the dark. For what can so little of a stream of blueness do against all the black ocean? Pohe, go to the Vale of Flowers and find the purple orchids at its center. Gather their petals, carry them to the banyan, and lay them at its roots. At his words, Pohe had trembled, for the children had been forewarned since the days of the island's first oracle, that if any among them should feed the great banyan with the plum-colored flowers that grew in the very midst of the vale, or should allow the flowers to spread and grow of themselves too near, the banyan's branches would creep to eclipse the moon and cover the sky, and with the moon gone blind, the sun would also lose her way, and the spirits of night, the Poe dwellers, would break from the nets that bewilder and reveal them, and work their works upon the island till men buried themselves in the earth, and pitched themselves headlong from high places for the darkness that would invade their souls. It was this darkness that Kayla had bid him unbind, and he obeyed because his awe of Kayla was more than his fear of what he had not yet seen. But now, as he closed upon the veil, the awe dwindled in him, and the fear increased. Perfumes of every manner of thing that flowers so choked the air that he nearly swooned, and most potent were the orchids. Rightly had his people chosen them as aphrodisiacs, for their scent clamored in the brain to forsake all care within the ecstasy of the moment. They were lavender, magenta, umber, indigo, and steel gray, rose, saffron, party-colored, and white. They were the size of a needle's point, and larger than his head. They grew solitarily, they grew bunched in hundreds, on long spikes, on tree branches, on rocks, dove orchids, spider orchids, moth, tiger, and bamboo. The potion of their powers together made the ground beneath him seem to undulate, as though it were the skin stretched over a tide that tilted to and fro. And now he saw, amidmost of all, the flowers he had come for, the purple blooms of the taboo, swaying before his seasick eyes. His strength to remain even half erect, seeping away, he wriggled toward them pitifully on his belly. He reached them. He put out his hand. The world ran purple in his sight as he took hold of them. Kayla chose too weak a one to perform his task, he thought, and the thought that came after was that he was not sorry that he had failed. That thought was the last he would think as mortal man, for, still clutching the flowers, he sank to sleep and did not wake. Maku... Your task is to come with me to the south, where blows the damned wind, and there to aid me and those who adhere to me in my cause in gathering rock. Then I and they shall bear what we have gathered to the place where I will build the scorpion's shrine, that to it all powers inimical to the goddess might be mustered. But you, Maku, while we bear the rock and build, go to the cone where is said to dwell a creature of fire that is Kailari's servant, and call out a challenge to it while the scorpions assemble. They shall wring it within their tails and instill it with their poison until it is cold and without breath. Then come to the Pali and meet me with Pohi at the hallowed peak, for I go to unhallow it for the love of those that have died and those that are yet unborn. Unlike the meeker Pohi, Maku had neither doubted nor trembled at the command of Kela. He was a man of action and not of contemplation, his muscles more valued than his mind and he, for his own part, had always chafed at the restraints of living at one with the goddess's pleasure, though they were few. Time was when he had feared to break that bond, 
but Kayla's rebellion had encouraged him to a new boldness. Now, as he mounted the slope of the cone, purposefully tearing at the honeysuckles and angels' trumpets to damage them, he would have swaggered in his cock sureness could he have done so and still ascend. At length he reached the top and peered over the cone's rim, and instantly he shrouded his eyes from the molten incandescence that assailed them, yet not soon enough to prevent their being seared. He knew that they would pain him for some weeks, and his anger at this insult to his body's pride caused him to issue a challenge before another instant wasted. Slave of Kyalari, he shouted with studied insolence, his words cleaving to the cone's spewing ash and spinning with it on the whirling wind. Come forth to her funeral and yours. He waited, but the lava torches neither burned brighter in response nor were subdued. The ash rose nor sank upon the wind and spanned still at its selfsame speed, and no creature emerged from fire into day's inferior light. He waited longer, and yet his challenge was not answered. It fears to come forth and defend her honor, he thought, or else it cares nothing for her majesty, or else it lives not in the cone at all, nor anywhere. Neither has the shark that serves her shown itself to any swimmer in the lagoon. I deem that both of them are myths of the oracle's invention to keep us under their hand. We in the waters of life are free already, have always been so, though we have not known it. Maku stared back down the cone, the fierce energy of his tread pounding out the cadence of victory over an enemy turned phantom. A sudden reciprocal pounding like that of the earth's own heart and rupturing of the ground beneath him laid him upon his face. He swung his head around to see a geyser of liquid flame shoot high heavenward from the cone and to see its brimming bowl overflow. His soul, whose existence before now he had scarcely acknowledged, was transformed into a repository of terror. He lurched to his feet and ran, the slopes hindering him. If he could but stay ahead of the boiling river that ran behind, he might survive, if he might reach the shore and take refuge in the quenching sea. From sea of heat to sea of cold he fled, for the fire that flowed was now more sea than river, and it moved in waves. One overtook him at the base of the cone, but it did not kill him. It curled itself lovingly around him rearwards. Then it withdrew, but not before charring the skin from his back and crumbling his long mane of hair to ash that spiraled up the wind to mingle with the cone's own. Maku shrieked in agony, but he continued running toward the ocean, daring not to look behind for peril of losing his life for the sake of that one moment. He ran through smoking grass and thistles, burning, and at last set foot upon the beach. Flame-shriveled scorpions fell like hailstones around him to lie black upon the black sands. Yet a few more paces in his agony would be preserved for his proper span of centuries remaining. But from behind him came a voice, the essence of fire, speaking. Turn to me, Maku, turn to me. Knowing that he sealed his own fate, Maku turned. The same wave that had stroked him, and the creature swimming within it whose golden eyes he now saw, poised itself above him and did not crash down as though to offer him one prayer of escape. But now that Maku had turned, terror became the whole of him, and he could not turn back. The wave crashed, the earth sighed in sad fulfillment, and the sea of lava narrowed to a stream and retreated the way it had come, leaving a carcass black encased and hardening behind it. Then the sun went behind a cloud, the weight of which the world had never felt, and from the eastern desert at the globe's other extremity came a whip-crack of galvanic light, and the chariot wheels of thunder. Chapter 14. The End of All Flesh To the noise of thunder wheeling through the caverns of the sanctuary, Laurie woke. She saw no beam of the lamps that lit the wedding chamber, no gleaming of blue from the cavern of the fountain. All was black around her. It seemed to her that she had passed from following in the train of Kyalari's glory to weltering amid the chaos that attends the inhabitants of the land of night. Yet Kayla had long left her, and she sensed nothing else hurtful in this darkness. Then she understood that the light of the sanctuary had not failed, but that she was blind. She stood to her feet and made her way by memory and spirit's perception to the grotto of birth. Her thoughts were only of peace with what was, it was not strange to her that the rending of the veil between herself and the fountain's power had caused a curtain to be lowered between her vision and the things of the world. As she walked, slowly but without stumbling, her fingers went to her throat and traced the new-torn, long re imprint of Kayla's knife. Ah, oh, Kayla, she thought, even in your hatred you have given me a great gift. None but those who have breached the barrier of death can guess the wonders I have seen. She passed through the grotto, 
feeling beneath her hands its ferns and the slings that hung between them. Thunders clattering from the borders of the earth toward this place came infinitesimally nearer with each step, and an unfamiliar heaviness charged the air, a gathering of wide-scattered moisture to a point of meeting. The sound of the fountain's waters, and the scent of the night-blooming Sirius that ringed them round, did not grow less in intensity as she retreated from them, but it rather seemed that she now carried them with her, as though the waters were her sweat and spit and tears, and the flowers sprang up among her hair. She passed the sighing trees at the entrance to the sanctuary, and they bowed down their branches to sweep her with their leaves as she went by. Continuing back through the peninsula's gateways, she walked under an arch of stone into the land of twilight, not seeing the eerie masonry of nature looming tall upon the beach, yet executing her path around it without error. As blind she went on, harking to the thunder and the whisperings beneath its shout, a sense of struggle hovered about her, though within her nothing struggled. It was the struggling of another who groped wretchedly through the darkness, one who despaired at his useless eyes, lacking her inner sight. I will struggle in his pain that he may rest in my peace, she thought with joy, though she knew not who that other was. Then at once she ceased in her effort and stood still. It was the horses of Kailare. She was aware of their approach before their appearing, though appearance was less than shadows to her now. She was aware as they moved from no shape to soft stirrings to firm lines, from a mode of existence more truly real to this present of relative illusion. She felt them cantering all around her, heard their uncanny neighing, striking discord with the thunder in their hooves stamping at the sand. They reared up on their hind legs and brought their forelegs down close to her, but she had no fear of being trampled. Then one broke from their number. She smelt his sweet breath anointing her from above. He nuzzled at her cheek, kissed the scar upon her throat, and she knew that he desired her to ride him. He crouched low, and she mounted him. Clinging hard to his mane, she felt the wind race past her and the ground tumble away beneath. It was not told that any oracle had bestridden the steeds of heaven, and Lari trembled that she should be the first. She lay her head against his neck, sensing how in his progress he wavered briefly into his own world, the very world to which Kayla's knife had admitted her. And in the fleeting of that world's lucidity she saw again. At last his pacing slowed, and Lari knew that he drew near to the twilight border, beyond whose earthly limit the herd would not pass. She felt the cold wetness at her feet as he bore her along the twilight's edge on into the sea. The water rose to her ankles, her knees, and then her hips and waist. She sent her messenger thoughts down the years past, all of her scarce fourteen, in preparation for what she believed would be her expiring, final as that driven home by Kayla had not been. She did not grieve, but rather rejoiced at the prospect of the tides washing over her and carrying her away beyond the reef, rocking her gently till she arrived at the shore of her vision in death, the garden of Kailare, where the spirit of the fountain dwelt in all and the goddess herself walked in beauty. Her life had been short and full of pain, and the prophecy of her motherhood of a peculiar child had been undone in Kayla's imposition on her of a perpetual virginity. She did not understand why Kailari should impart to her a view of a thing not meant, but as she neared the final gathering unto her, she knew that it did not matter. Kayla had thrust her into a dark that now sped her toward dying, but in her life she had seen the works of wrath, and felt the fearful worship of the goddess's unseen majesty. She had known the name of Kailari, and that was enough. Yet, as she waited for the sea's whole immersion, she heard a voice, and it was not the voice of a man, nor was it the voice of a sinuous spirit. Look not behind, but on, it said, and her flesh thrilled to listen. The hour of your death is not now, and the day of your destiny not past. The way of it lies forward, through me, and beyond to forever. Take the way, Lari, for all other ways end. Then, within the palm of blackness, Lari saw a pearl of white, and the white grew large and square and taut, billowing to the blasts of the wind's breath above a vessel that rode the sea. Before the vessel went a wooden lady with golden hair and eyes of green, and though she was wood, Laurie saw that she lived. The lady's eyes yearned toward the island, and she pressed on to breach its reef as a bride is breached by her bridegroom at the moment of consummation. The lady's hands parted from her side, scattering splinters upon the water. Her eyes turned toward Lari, and Lari felt salt-wet wood curve around her fingers. The lady's tongue was loosed at her touch. "'My child is as yours, and yours is as mine,' said the lady. "'You have bound me to honor again.' The lady faded back to white, though Lari strained to keep the hand in hers, 
and the white beaded to a pearl, and blackness clenched it, and it was lost. Where is the meaning? the oracle cried, as the horse stepped out from under her in the world of his nativity. But before she could sink, she felt another creature swim to catch her underneath, and upon its back was no mane, but a fin. Taking hold, she knew whose the fin was. Her eyes pressed from darkness to behold the perfect blueness of it, and as it swam with her across the border of twilight, she now saw the lightning that the thunder trailed. She had ridden upon one of the horse herd of Kyalari, and now she rode the blue shark, the goddess's messenger of the water, whom she had blessed often in her prayers, but whose rise and fall of motion beneath the lagoon she had never glimpsed. Her knees hugged and her fingers stroked its fish skin with awe, and for a time she found no voice to speak with it as it transported her eastward along the north shore of the island where twined the viny flowers of its own color. Then at last, in a whisper, she said, Speak, Kyalari, for your servant attends. Speak, Lari, answered the shark, and learn what you would know. I would know, Lari began, thinking to ask the meaning of the visionary wooden lady in her words. Then she paused, for a question that had not allowed her ease for forty weeks usurped her urgency suddenly and totally. It was as though the shark itself conveyed to her a knowledge of what knowledge it wished to give her. In obedience to its wish, she asked, Messenger of Kyalari, I would know where is Turo. The waters of the crossing have gone black, it replied and that curse came for the sake of one among the children. Then, what Lari had guessed long at, she understood certainly. It is true that Kayla drowned him, and not merely my evil dreams. May the mercies of the goddess cleave to his soul, she said, not knowing even in her own heart which soul she meant. And then she said nothing else for a time. But when they had rounded the northeastern point of the rainforest and turned south, she asked, What curse will come now that her children have so far strayed? Will there be an end to the straying, or will they plunge off the sheer edge of her into what is not? There will be an end, and it will be upon all flesh, for all flesh that walks, walks in the violence of Kayla. Kyalari brings a thing she has not brought. The waters shall build to a flood strength within the clouds, and the clouds be torn under them, and all that runs wet above and beneath the ground shall take vengeance for the drowning of Turo, and the despising of Kyalari's pleasure for the death of sons and daughters that should have lived, and for the sins of a world besides. There will be an end, and there will be a beginning. Eight persons from beyond the seas has Kyalari chosen to subdue the earth anew, and from her children she has chosen you, Lari, and as many as will go with you. As many as will go, them lead by the secret way into the sanctuary, and take with you also the males and females of the animals the children cherish. When you and those who follow you are within, Kyalari will seal the sanctuary behind you, and those who have not followed but in the rebellion of Kayla will be consumed by the flood. And would you know, Lari, the meaning of the goddess's words that have been wrought and yet will be? It is given you to understand but a little, and with this be content. After the deluge will be a time of waiting, a time of changing and yet remaining at rest, a time of remembering even while you forget and then a time of fulfilling. Kayla in his pride has sought to feed the banyan, and he has failed. A time will come when one shall not fail, but shall indeed draw down the obscurity in which dwell the spirits of night, and soul's darkness shall reign upon the island until that curtain be lifted. Kayla has sought to call forth to harm my fellow servant that dwells within the cone, but the time of its coming forth is not yet. A time shall be of war leading into peace, misfortune become fortunate, and freedom shall be bound to the service of destiny when the child that Kayla should have fathered finds his sire in another. And then the fire's messenger shall come forth to guide you to the fountain in your need, for the way to it shall be lost for long. Before that time, before the banyan's dark, the island's last light, and before your death, you shall see me once more, and by your seeing of me you will know that the hour of meaning is at hand. I will not speak with you then, but there will be other voices for your counsel and signs for your reading. Wait for me, Lari, and for the second end, for though I tarry, yet will I appear at last. But now let us hasten, for Kayla raises a shrine of blasphemy upon the hallowed summit, for all the earth is scarlet with shame, and the first ending is at hand. Then, as the shark turned westward along the upper curve of the lagoon, the thunder that occupied the void left by its voice ceasing, caused Lari to look up for the first time since regaining her sight. 
clouds mustered in serried ranks, obese with water yet gorging still, black clad and lightning armed, they marched before the sun, and for a moment amid their imitation of night the steed of Kayalare shone out above, then it was besieged also by clouds. Turning and pulsing in their need to discharge their burden, they extended their pall of pain over the whole blue of the sky. Behold the tears of Kayalare, said the shark, and Lare felt upon her upturned face a drop of water. Ronnie knelt at the door of her hut beside the decaying body of her son, yet unburied. She had pleaded with Kayla that he might be borne beyond the reef by seven swimmers, as was the children's custom with their dead. But her husband would have none of the ways of Kayalare, and would permit those who followed him in sympathy to have none. Indeed, he had grown hard since Kiru's death, though with his voice he had made lamentation and uttered threats, yet he had shed no tears, how unlike hers whose tears could not be sounded. Ronnie, having loved him so well, now dreaded the centuries yet to spend beside him. She wished that she had died with her firstborn, yearned to be with that one whom only she now desired, rather than to bear other children whose burial Kayla would not allow and see him grow yet harder. She had feared since his taking of her to pray to Kailari, but now at the end of her hope she did pray, a prayer without words, for she knew not what to ask, except that she might not wear away her life remaining beside the decaying body of a child, brushing away the insects that troubled it, and gazing beyond the lagoon for a deliverance that would not come. Scattered by ones about the lagoon were the island's other women, all kneeling within hailing distance of one another, all kneeling speechless. Thunder told the secret sufferings of their hearts, though its sound bypassed their hearing. There were a few who, like Ronnie, tended dead infants, and there were more than not who tended also the heaped dust of loves that were betrayed to living death. All of the men, the last of them this hour, had joined with Kayla. Not one had held back at his bidding to defile with him the hallowed peak. Not one had refused the adultery of locking hands in the scorpion's dance. The men had gone and the women were left, waiting for the terror their mates conjured to possess them. All the women waited but for Lare. Ronnie looked toward the oracle's hut that stood not far from hers and saw there were no signs of habitation. Has Kayla killed her, she wondered? Has he killed the one I should have wed? In the same hour we became sure of Kiru's conceiving, he admitted to me the deed and boasted of it. Was it even then that my love for him began to fail? Ronnie thought of Lare and envisioned her lying lifeless somewhere upon the island, perhaps at the banyan's foot, or at the foot of the cone, or at Kayla's feet upon the poly, decaying like her son. Blessed Kayalari, let her not be dead, she prayed. Or if she is dead, then, blessed mother, show us the same favor, for our hearts can brook no more grief. Ronnie waited, brushing off insects, smelling death stench. And to her eyes, where they were fixed upon the lagoon, there came a vision, the ghost of Lari riding upon a blue shark toward the shore. Ronnie smiled and thanked the goddess. Then she heard a stirring among the other kneelers, and she knew that the vision had not been vouchsafed to her alone, and looking again she saw that Lari was no ghost. The women rose and huddled together in silence, none approaching the meeting of the waves and sand where, the shark having left her, the oracle now stood. The women would not draw near her, nor did Lari draw near her, but she held out her arms in invitation. They will not go to her except I go first, thought Ronnie. But why I? Yet she walked from Kiru's corpse across the beach to Lari, gathering courage from the blue eyes that her husband had forsworn. She did not stop until Lari had taken her into her arms. As she went, the other women took each the hand of one beside them and came after her. Lari gazed at her with love and said, as though it were a blessing, Kayla is doomed, Ronnie. Yes, Lari, Ronnie answered. He is doomed. In his doom he has doomed many others. He will doom you also if you cleave to him still. Will you still cleave? I love him, despite of all, but I will not cleave to him if death is more to him than life. Death has become all his desire, and he must abide the sentence he has passed upon himself. All that are men among the children must abide it with him, but you that are women, if you will, may escape. Come with me to the sanctuary, now, at once, before the judgment of the waters is unbound. Want always to follow, yet now for the second time in as many months, Ronnie would have led. But another of the women spoke before her, one who also had forsaken a corpse in drawing near to the oracle. 
What refuge is there for us with the goddess? It is she who has slain our children. Riven by bitterness, the woman wept. Others wept with her, and they too murmured their complaints against the goddess. Tears ran in Rani's eyes, the murmurs girding in her ears like the laughter of Kayla at some coarse joke. Will they not cease, she thought? And she said, It is not the goddess that has slain our children, but my own husband. If your tears seem bitter to you, how bitter are mine, how bitter still are the tears of Kyalari. Lari kissed her cheek. Bitter indeed are Kyalari's tears. Even while we speak, feel how the bitter rain is shed. Then Rani and all the women at once became aware that water fell from the sky upon them. The sea where the rain united with it began to whirl, and each wave upon the sand broke its descent from higher than the last. As the rain mingled with their tears and the waves sang dirges to them, the women cried out with fear. But Lari said, Do not be afraid, only follow. I walk the secret way to the sanctuary, and you shall walk with me. As you go, think upon our weaker cousins, the animals. Gather them up by twos, for they will not bear the burden of matelessness as we. Gather the eels from their ponds, let the foxes light upon your shoulders, and the pigs snuffle at your heels, and coax the dogs from their own fear with gentle words, and whistle to the birds with the songs of escape from Kayla's curse. Male and female, gather them in from the tears of the goddess, and let yourselves be gathered now in haste, for soon her bitterness will so flow over us that we can walk no more. Then Lari set off through the forest toward the hidden door in the rock, and Rani in the shelter of her arm. The other women held back until one of them, great with child, looked once toward the Polly to bid her child's father farewell, and followed after. Then one by one followed the rest, and two and two the animals came within their care. Through the hidden door they passed, through the spirit gateways that the mercy of the goddess had opened to them. And at last they entered beneath the stone arch the sighing grove, and the trees knitted themselves together behind them as they went on. When they reached the fern grotto they looked back, and saw a wall of branches so tight woven that no force of elements could breach it. Then they turned from that which was behind to that which lay ahead, to the chamber of wedding and the waters of the fountain, where they worshipped and found solace for their tears while the world drowned. Kayla stood upon the hallowed summit of the Pali, shielding his eyes from the glare and observing how his plan progressed. He watched the men who had come over to his cause, every male among the children, maneuvering raft after raft laden with stones from the land of the south toward the land of streams. When the rafts were breached, the men labored to bear the stones to the Pali's foot, and from there they hauled them by means of ropes to the summit, where Kayla directed them in forming a ring of pillars. When that ring was complete, he would offer within it sacrifice of animals now being hunted for the purpose, and would call upon the spirits of night to rise in power and reorder the life of the children in freedom unbounded. He was weary. In his flight from the sanctuary and amid his fashioning of strategies, he had forgotten sleep, but now he remembered it with yearning. His mind was weary with thought, his heart with hate, and his body with toil, and the cloud-soiled light, at once uncomfortably glaring and dull, added to his trouble in keeping his eyes from closing. Soon, he thought, very soon we shall see clearly, for though the Po dwellers bring dimness for a time, yet at its end there will be glories of color when the gray of the goddess's rule is purged. My men no longer need my oversight, for they have their commands, and I must have my strength for the sacrifice and what will follow. I will rest now for a time. I will sleep." Giving instruction that he not be disturbed till the last stone was placed and the animals prepared, Kayla lay himself upon the summit and slept at once, but not dreamlessly. At first his dreams were only of darkness, for in them the night spirits had taken up already their scepter and crown. Though the waters of the fountain insinuated their song into his hearing against his will, he was yet content to wait out the dark, for soon that music would sound never again but at his bidding. Then it seemed to him as he dreamt that he saw Ronnie lying asleep in their hut, her night lamp burning near her, and in the circle of the lamplight stood a naked man. Kayla cried out in warning to her, but as he cried he was carried away to the reef and could not see the deed done to his woman, though he sensed that it was cruel, and could not feel what emotion was in her heart's beating, though he knew that it was hurt. Then within his dreams the sun rose, and issuing from the dawn's whiteness upon the waves was a white cloth secured by ropes to a strange vessel, terrible in his sight, writing the vessels were beings in whose eyes flamed the light of gods. 
The eyes of one were dark like Ronnie's, and that one, clothed in a garment whose shoulders were banded with gold, held aloft a coffer of wood and spilled its contents into the sea. The eyes of the second were light brown like the skin of dead Kiru, and he, wearing a circlet of moss roses upon his brow, wept and yet sang as he went. A third had eyes as blue as Lare's, but paler, and an amulet hung about his neck that depicted a man fastened upon crossbeams, and this third among the gods stretched out his arms and enfolded the world. And he, Kayla, heard a voice that said, You have lost the wisdom of the fountain, but another will find it. You have despised the love that is perfect, but another will cherish it. You have sacrificed children to pride, but another will save them. Then the gods with their vessel retreated, and all was dark once more. But still he heard and hated the waters, and now he felt them falling upon him as well. And he heard his own voice saying, as it had said within him on the morn of Kiru's death, Would that the water should fall rather than rise as she has ordained it. Would that the water would fall, would fall, would fall. Kayla woke beneath a torrent of rain. In his groggy confusion, it seemed to him that the island had tipped down side up, the waterfall running backwards from its lake terminus to the hallowed summit to overflow him. Then his eyes righted themselves, and he looked up in craven fear at the sable clouds from which the water dove. But he was given no leisure to penetrate their belligerent intent. A man among the children touched his shoulder from behind. He staggered to his feet and whirled to face the man, seeing his fear magnified in the man's eyes sevenfold. Pardon us, Kayla, the man whimpered. We hunted the animals, but they have gone from the forest, and the women also are all gone. We laded the last raft with stone, but the waters came. The waters. Aye, we are drowning. Aye, aye. Kayalari, have mercy. Then the man, even amid his wail, shrank back from Kayla, thinking to be punished for naming the goddess. But Kayla stared only in a shock so complete that the man saw at once that he would never be moved again. He said nothing about the shrine, the animals, or the women, but asked in a dead voice, Where is Pohi? I do not know, Kayla, the man answered, his sick terror merging its tears with the rain. And Maku? The man did not reply, but his eyes turned unwillingly southward. Kayla's gaze followed them. He saw the cone belching gently, like a one who has fed well and is now content, and he traced the path of its abated hunger to the western shore, where stood a thing like a man-sized doll, all black. He turned toward the eastern sea, and saw the males among the children, one by one, slipping into it, driven by the rain. Turning back to the man who had crowned him with tidings of disaster, he saw the man's tears. If only I could weep, he murmured, but the dust weeps not. Then at last he would have turned to the sanctuary where he knew that Ronnie had gone, but from behind him came a huge rushing, and the words, Where is Turo, your friend? The last man but for himself left alive looked past him toward the sanctuary in the northwest, turned chalk-white, and fell dead at his feet. I must look behind, thought Kayla. I will not shun the sight of my death as Lari shunned hers. He gritted his teeth with the struggle, but remained rigid as the stone pillars that ringed him in. Again came the rushing and the words, Where is Turo? It did not now enter Kayla's mind to lie. He is beneath the waters. So also will you be. The words were spoken serenely, with no hint of threat. Rage he might have raged at again, but the serenity in the voice melted Kayla inwardly to less than a man. He lost control of his functions and dirtied and wetted himself, and he made no more effort to turn. Where are the babes that were barred from the fountain, though they had done no wrong? The rushing asked. Kayla's inner eyes reached out to the body of Kiru lying in decay, and from it to the ocean's floor, where in the pleasure of Kyalari it should have rested. They are... And all at once he was able to answer truthfully, as the rushing would have wished, though his last words were heard only within the wave that drowned the island. Beneath the waters. Chapter 15 Forty Days and Forty Nights Beneath the tears of Kyalari came an end upon all flesh, but for four women and four men in an ark launched from the gardens of the east and the animals with them, and but for the females among the children of Kyalari and the animals with them in a cavern refuge under the earth. The fountains of the great deep were broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened. The poly and the cone and all mountains else were covered, and the waters prevailed exceedingly until the dust had no place. 
For days and nights forty it rained, one night for every week that Ronnie and her unfortunate sisters carried within them their babes that never saw the sun. For a hundred and fifty days the waters rained. Then the ark struck ground on Ararat, and the sighing trees at the entrance to the sanctuary unmeshed, and the fathers and mothers of all nations came forth from the one, and from the other came forth women who had none to make them mothers. Yet the latter came forth more bountifully than they went in, for on the day the rain began there was born in the fern grotto a girl child. Her father drowned and so not able to do the deed. She was immersed in the fountain thrice by Lare, and never before among the children was there one so purely good as she, as though the goddess had sent her special blessing as a balm for sorrow. The child's name was Nika, full of grace. The fourth comers from the ark replenished the earth with humanity. Nations rose and fell into decay and rose again, while the island, the breach in its reef, having been fused by the flood, remained untouched by them and begot no new history of its own. When on the plain of Shinar one built a tower to reach unto heaven, and the Lord confounded the speech of men, on the island the language changed also, and the tongue the children came at last to speak was not unlike that of their near but never seen neighbors, the Tahitians. When Abraham was called out of Ur to be the father of the chosen race, when David and his son by Bathsheba became that race's princes, and when the Israelites were carried captive into Babylon, upon the island all continued the same. Though when on Calvary's mount the death of a Nazarene turned the skies black, the island was darkened too, leaving its oracle to wonder if the night of the banyan had overtaken her unawares. When Paul preached in the streets of Ephesus and Peter was crucified head downward, while the church Catholic was polluted and cleansed, rent asunder and re -knit. The island anticipated only the changes of slow age and gradual expiring, remembering only the others that had once gladdened it with laughing strength, until even that memory grew weak, and the echoes of laughter died nearly away. And the lamp the island's women kept burning was a memorial not of the others only, but of the waters of Kailare, for though the goddess succored them still, a part of their knowing of her was lost with the others. The fountain of life that was the heart of her sanctuary was buried to all but their hearing, for after their coming forth at the end of the deluge by the hidden door, the sacred way was sealed. And in the course of years, even Lari could not recall the place in the rock where the door had been. Though it rained for forty days and forty nights, and afterward the rainbow, yet each day and each night was as a century to the children that remained. For so long did the desolation brought down upon them by the rain endure. And then, in the twilight of the eighteenth century, when seafaring nations were at war, there came a day that dawned over the island upon an only remnant of three women. And there came a night when Lare, oracle through all the millennia that had waned, walked home from her bath to a bed that stayed not solitary, and saw by the light of her night lamp the moment where her history and her futurity met. Chapter 16. The Third Mountain Though I have dredged from my heart's benighted deep the skeletons of many tales, yet have none been raised to the sun with such sorrow clinging to them as this. Though I have skimmed fair visions in which to clothe them from the tide-pools of thought, yet my net of words has held within it none so wonderful. And I, Clement, am chosen among men to know this fragment of the story that is endless, chosen as one of only three to know it, except Paradise should cast us to the winds of purgatory again. Here is Paradise, here upon this island. I need no more to trap beauty in word or song, for it binds me everywhere around, all human gifts excelling. I take it into me as I respire, drinking from the lips of Nika. I leave my captain in the keeping of his devil, and my adopted saint in the keeping of his master Christ. For here I commit my chaplain's office to the spirit of the fountain, that it may work its own work in us all without hindrance. Here I, Jonah Nehemiah, lay down my hatred for the father that damned me. Here I bury my pain for the mother that blessed me knowing that she is many years dead and in heaven. Here I cease to strive with God, for I know that the heart of him has grieved for me indeed, and I will grieve it no more. Here I let go from me all the sweet demons and the bitter angels of dreams, and let the perfect justice and priceless wisdom which I, like Kayla, have suffered in evading, have its way with me. Here is the rainbow beyond the faithless flood. Here is my joy fulfilled." Shirtless and bootless, his bare feet lapped by turquoise shallows, Clement sat on the sun-warmed rocks bordering the pearl-white beach of the land of hills. He watched where far out the seas gathered to build sheer walls topped with battlements of spray. And farther yet, 
no longer overhung by trade wind clouds, he saw in his mind's eye where warships beat through squalls only to be broken by cannon fire. He reeled his gaze back quickly, for he cared not even to dabble with the world beyond the reef, nor hardly even the world beyond its incarnation in Nika who sat beside him. He looked at her, but said nothing to the tale she had told him, for it was beyond questioning, and Nika said nothing, for it seemed that the tale had drained her of speech. They sat listening quietly to the running of the fountain that seemed so distant and yet so near. Clement saw that Nika was troubled. He took her face between his hands and drew it to rest upon his shoulder. "'What is it, Nika?' he whispered. "'Do I make you unhappy?' "'No, Clement,' she answered. "'You are all my happiness, and I would be yours. And it is this that makes me sad, for I know that I am not enough.' "'Not enough? But you could not be more.' Nika shook her head. It is hard for you to understand, and hard for me to speak, as I mean. But my lack is this. I have no memory. The tale I have told you is not my tale. I knew nothing of the others, nothing of Kyalari as they made her more plain, of the time when she was also he. Though the fountain gifted me at birth with its life, yet with eyes of age enough to comprehend what it beholds, I have never seen the waters of Kyalari. I have lived thousands of years with nothing to look back on, looking forward to nothing, for no other remained to coax a child from my body that my meaning might continue when my flesh is lost to the earth. And now you, and other, have come to me, and I have nothing stored up of what has gone by to bestow on you, and though the joy of you fills my present, I have no history, so I look to the future and can believe that I have none. Clement shook his head in turn, almost smiling at the irony of her complaint. If you lack, Nika, it is only as the Blessed Virgin is said to lack the stain of every other woman's sin. But if your lack troubles you, then you may make your own the past that I would fain forget. And yet my history has been unclean and would not be fit for you to know. But for the future, have you not spoken of me as he that is meant? If I am so, then I may give you a child, and one that will live. Except it be bathed in the waters, Clement, it will not live long. I would not be glad to see its death. If I could, I would take you to the waters, but the unsealing of them is not within my hands. Yet consider this, neither will I live long, for neither have the waters anointed me, and I have worn out more than my year's strength in coming to you. And it may be, if Kyalari and my God that as her other face are merciful, your own allotment of years may end with mine. We will make a child together, Nika, and it will be the bearer of our future, and with it the children of Ronnie and of Lare and of Brian and of Dominic. Nika looked away northwards toward the jungle of the banyan. And what dark future will that be? Dominic walks in the footsteps of Kayla. Lare is wounded newly with the same wound, and Ronnie feels the sting of the poison again. And Brian will have no child. The pleasure of Kyalari is thwarted, and the deluge not yet done. Clement turned his face back to himself. I have lived my life in regretting what has been, in both yearning and fearing what is to be, and you at last have taught me that joy is now, and I will not let your love for me unteach you what you have always known. The beginning and the end are in the hands of Kyalari. Let them there remain. Nika smiled. I will do so, Clement, for even now my darkness is passing. And yet there is one thing I wish— when Lari told me the tale of the children, it stirred my heart, but I did not cry. Never in these thousands of years have I shed tears. Make a tale for me, Clement, one that is my own, and I will listen and weep, and I will be joyful then and always. Clement dug deep, through crust of hardness, down to what was most tender in himself, to mold for Nika a tale. It was this. Long ago, or perhaps it was but yesterday, or will not be until tomorrow, in a village on the coast of the land we call Ireland, there lived a girl of sixteen years. She was rosy-cheeked and fair, but she caught the fancy of no young man among the village, nor had any taken her fancy, for there was a tamelessness and a mysterious distance in her eyes, as though the blood of the fays ran its course in her with that of womankind, and yet she was as human as heartbreak. While other lasses of her age were kissing with the lads that courted them, wedding and giving birth and bouncing babes upon their knees, she passed the hours when she was not at labor gazing out at sea, or haunting the docks where the fishing boats were moored, talking with the old fisherman who was her only friend. 
His skin was tough and tanned, his hair white and beard waist-long, and his smile nearly toothless. Yet his sinews were still strong and his mind clear at nigh on a century old. His name was Patrick Peter John Jeffrey, and he told her tales of all that he had seen and all that he had imagined. And though he told them and swore to the truth of every one of them, with a wink, a chuckle, and a click of his tongue, yet in his eyes there was a melancholy and a wild exulting she recognized from her own looking-glass. And she loved him in her way more than the lasses their lads and the mothers their babes. While others found their fulfilling in the simplicity of commonplace things, the girl wedded her strange longings with the fishermen's stories of phantom ships and castles of cloud, of how ancient strifes were kindled and quenched with true loves won by the performance of impossible tasks, of how no mortal man can lie next the queen of fairies and live, and no woman hold a man whose mistress is the sea. And though he chided her for spending her youth at his side rather than consorting with those of her own years, he did not send her away, for he saw that her spirit was akin to his, too high-reaching to grow in cottage gardens, yet too tender to be cast out among the stinging nettles. Each day she came to the docks and listened to his tales, and each evening she walked by the sea, pondering what she had heard, dreaming dreams that were more real to her than the waking visions of most. And of all he told her, what she thought most upon and what moved her to dream most deeply was this. Lass, he had said, some there are that never may find their own heart's love, and this all men know. But it has been known by only a few, scattered through many lands and times, how that these solitary ones, if their yearning be deep enough, may meet with the spirits of their beloveds in visions or in sleep, though the miles or the years between them be never so great and ever unbreachable by human means. These visitations may be, but lest you yearn too quickly to be so visited, consider whether it is more painful to forsake all thought of the love between man and woman, and offer your heart to another cause, or to know that somewhere beyond seas or mountains there dwells, or has dwelt, or will, your soul's perfect mate, who through the tragedy of fortune may never be seen by you but in the fragile guise of spirits, which wake too soon to find themselves empty." may never share in the gladness of the hearth, or bless the cradle with sons and daughters that bear the stamp of both your features upon their face and the heritage of your cherishing in their hearts. Consider, and consider well, which is the harder choice, lest you pray for the vouchsafing of that which wounds you more deeply than you can bear when your prayer is granted. For myself, I believe with St. Paul that the solitary are happier if they abide with their hearts fixed on God. But there are those who cannot abide, who cannot help but that their hearts should go wandering. And the girl knew, by the quavering in the fisherman's voice and the light in his eyes, as he looked out to sea, that his had been the latter choice. She thought on this, when, with the falling of the dark, she stood upon the shore, and on one evening in early spring, the eve of the Ides of March, as she gazed out upon the waves, she saw far off a glimmering. A flush and a chill of piercing joy passed through and through her, and she stood perfectly still and watched as the glimmering drew nearer. At last she perceived that it was a ship— eerily illuminated as is no earthly craft, the very northern lights all hung about her sable sails. The ship was of terebinth, decked garishly with bespangled pennons that fluttered in the breeze. The spume-flecked waves flared ultramarine where her prow cleft through them. Like some proud corsair, fay and fresh from the plundering, as though she wielded Neptune's own trident, the ship drave on for shore, her cannons thundering. Forward straight and sure, as if drawn by an irresistible lodestone, she drave on, and the girl understood, in the wisdom of her soul, that it was herself for which the ship and the ship's master sought. The ship drave on for shore until presently it faded away into the darkness, and the girl beheld it no more, and she walked home to the house of her father with shivering skin and a heart full of pain. She said nothing of her vision to the fisherman, yet she knew that he sensed what she did not speak. The days passed ever more quickly between her labor her sea-walks, and the fishermen's tales. And then on an evening she was visited a second time. Due westward from the lonely beach where she roamed was an offshore island on which never a man had set foot. And this island rose to a lofty peak at each end and sank to a deep-delved vale in between. As she stood on an evening beneath the summer moon looking toward it, there appeared between the peaks a third mountain, glowing with the same light beyond nature as had glistered the ship. Upon its crest stood a splendid castle, ornamented with fluted spires, fantastical traceries, and arabesque. Wrought it was in barrel and porphyry, and lanterns shone out at every window, and as she beheld it, the same quivering of joy as at her first visitation running through her. 
From its turrets she heard a host of trumpets braying, and amid their noise a voice cried, Hither come, hither come. And so it was repeated again and again, till trumpets and voice died to a whisper, and the castle and the mountain dissolved in the night. And the days passed, and the weeks, and again one night she was vouchsafed a vision. Yet it may be called a vision only for want of other word, for it was a thing not seen but felt. And she gazed out to sea where the ship had cleaved the waters, then turned to the island where the mountain had appeared with the home of her heart's desire on its crest. The voice that had bid her come hither pitied her helplessness to heed its behest and come rather to her. It was as a melding of spirit and wind, invisible, but more palpable than the arms of any lover and like those arms in its intent. It wound itself around her, bound her fast within its ghostly manacles and dashed her to the sand, regaling her with caressings, as though her tears wet the beach at the touch of it. She wanted never again to rise from its prison of love. And yet at last, as she knew it must, as a highwayman ravishes a passing maiden for an hour and leaves her with only the memory and perhaps the seed of his strange child. And the weeks passed, and the years, and ever and anon the girl beheld the growing glimmer of the ship, was bidden to come to the third mountain, and was ravished by the voice of a sleeping, dreaming lover from what land or time she could not know. And at last her visitations were her only holiday from solitude, for the breath of the old fisherman went out finally with the ebbing of the tide and did not return. And she remembered his admonition to consider her choice, and she considered, and lo, she could not remember having chosen. And she understood that, after all, the choice had not been hers to make, but was made for her by another. Clement's voice died away, and Nika wept upon his naked breast, and he comforted her. And at last she said, It was he that came to her in visions, is it not so, Clement? Who, Nika, who came to her? It was the fisherman. He knew that his flesh must soon wed with death, so the spirit of him when he was young came to court her instead. Clement did not contradict her, for though he had not intended it so, the tale was Nika's, and if she so read its meaning, then so it was. I pray to the goddess, said Nika, that if one of us must live on beyond the other with only visions, it is not I. I am selfish to pray so, and yet, though you see yourself as wavering, I believe that for your very weakness' sake you are stronger than I. But I do not keep my promise, for I said that I would be joyful when you had given me my tale, and so I shall be. Come swim with me, Clement, to the reef, and feast your eyes with mine on the wonders of Kyalari. Nika rose to her feet, and put off from her first her shoulder scarf and then her waist cloth, so that the majesty of her nakedness was humbled only by the petals and leaflets of fragrant flowers which she had fashioned to wiry stalks of coconut and placed above each ear. Clement put off his breeches and stood beside her, unclothed but for the ribbon that bound back his hair. She stepped to an outcropping of rock where the water was deep and dove, and he plunged into the wetness after her. After her he swam through glassy blue shifting to green and back, to where the architecture of myriad corals fused to form the island's bulwark. He saw the stinging fire corals, yellow-brown and tipped with white, the organ-pipe corals, inhabited by brightly colored worms with feathery tentacles, by polyps shaped like miniature sea anemones that clustered in sixes or multiples of six, by tiny octopuses, by starfish who by night perched atop the pipes, reaching out to plankton for food. Horny corals, stony corals, the soft coral called dead man's fingers, the precious corals, the blue and the black, tree and slipper corals, mushroom and honeycomb, pink and purple and brick red, and beyond the corals, the wonders of fishes. He saw the new that lies buried in coral sand, its spines hollow like the fangs of rattlesnakes and also poisonous, the tapatapu, orange and black spangled, the butterfly fish that makes lifelong marriages, the blue ulua, the lavender tang, and the ku ta, scarlet and vermilion with large inky eyes and a dorsal fin carved seemingly out of red sealing wax. He looked on as Nika swam rings around the manta ray with its demon horns, the conger eel, the zebra and dragon mores. He watched as she water danced amidst fishes resembling lions, parrots and porcupines, unicorns and angels. He saw fishes that were incandescent, steel blue with jet stripes, and bellies of glistening silver white. He saw hosts of hermit crabs, huge and red and black and hairy. He bore witness to these and many wonders else of Kyalari's oceans, 
until at last Nika darted away from him, giving him chase with her superior speed along the eastern shore of the wild land of the south, where a leaning crag cast its shadow over the waters and turned them cold. Clement lifted his eyes to the crag that darkened Nika's wake, and he felt a sudden fear of her prayer to die before him, and he remembered for the first time since finding her his vision of the swordfish piercing him which he had seen just ere the honor-bound breached the island's reef. But the joy of Nika would not permit his brooding, for now she swam quickly to shore, pausing upon the blinding white sand, allowing him almost to catch her. Then laughing, she sped northward along the beach, picking up shells one by one as she went. She scooped a cowrie into her palm, then a sundial shell, then a periwinkle, next a triton, a mitre, a venus shell, and a tusk. Last of all she grasped a chambered nautilus, and with this she turned westward, running along the streams that ran among the hills. Soon she passed out of sight, yet Clement was able to trace her path by the shells she let drop one by one as she gathered them. He stooped to retrieve them as he ran, hearing her laughter far ahead of him mingling with liquid music. Long after her, he came finally to the feet of the green cliffs of the Polly. He looked up and saw above him three peaks, a towering cascade of silver water hurtling from the crest of the central and highest. A third mountain, he muttered, shivering. He heard the voice of Nika, muted nearly beyond his deciphering by the waterfall, that cried out, Hither come, Clement, hither come. He laid down his burden of shells on the shore of the lake fed by the falls. Taking hold of tree roots that clung to the cliff's ledges, he began to climb, up basaltic rocks hung with parasitical plants, resting as he went in recesses damp and chill. An hour after the chase had begun, he stood beside Nika on the summit of the Polly. He stood where Kayla had stood pleading with Lara and where the last wave had overthrown him. Turning from the waterfall, Clement led his chosen bride into the ring of ruinous stone, between whose pillars the powers of darkness would have tasted sacrifice, had they been given time. He drew her down to the earth, drunk in the smell of blossoms in her hair. Not here, Clement, she whispered, but he answered, Here is the hallowed place of Kyalare, long unloved. Now, after the lonely centuries, let us sanctify it to her once again. Chapter 17 Shadow Across the Moon Mother of harlots, claw me numb, he breathed, wondering where he had heard the words before. His passion expended, he rolled away from her to lie upon his back, and gazed up to where the branches of the banyan splayed their shadow over the aftermath of his domination. It was a monument of power, this great tree, like the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There was a majesty in the multiplication of its trunks shooting skyward like phalluses, and a malformation as of an image induced by drugs. He sensed the power in it, though he knew nothing yet of how to release it, for Ronnie had not told him. She had not told him how he reenacted an illicit history in preferring her above her sister Lare, for Lare had warned her in a moment apart from him that knowledge was a danger in his hands. Yet the seeker was not so easily to be turned aside, and Dominic let his eyes fall now from the banyan to the choicest of his lovers lying beneath it with his sea chest at her head. He saw how she lay fearfully still and not facing him, and he read a shame in her as after each time he had taken her. Shame was not for those whose selfhood was full-grown, and he would teach her to forsake it by and by. Now and here was the last lap of his race, and he would waste no words, hearing as he did the very love beckonings of the spirit bride for which he ran in the sound of waters. Ronnie, he said, being careful not to touch her, but pricking her with his eyes, show me the way to the fountain of life. A yelp of shock bled from her. She stared at him with dilating pupils, his shade forcing her eyes to seek further for light, but she did not answer him. Ronnie, he said again, allowing his fingertips to just brush her cheek. Mine is the power, Ronnie. Did you think I did not know? She shut her eyes wholly against him, but he massaged her lids open again. He blew his breath upon her lips. Ronnie, show me the way. Ronnie whimpered like a dog that will abide its master's kicks rather than forsake him. Laurie has forbidden me. Laurie is nothing, a chip of kindling before the fire of you. Why would you obey her? She is the oracle, and only the false and shallow forbid discovery. I myself am an oracle. I have gained my gift at the hand of many adepts, and have surpassed them. I can gift you also with many things if you will. 
but only in payment for the one thing I ask. Give me what I ask, Ronnie, now while it hurts but a little. I know that you are not strong. Ronnie's look was the same as he had seen in many women's eyes, a mixture of unwilling worship and hate, yet hers was more despairing. No, Dominic, I am not strong. So I tell you that there are two ways to the fountain, and they are both impassable, and have been so since the long rain. I have given the thing you asked. Now ask me no more. I have sought for the fountain for thirteen years. It is not enough, Ronnie. Tell me more of the two ways. Ronnie looked away from him in resignation. There is a way through the rock wall that bars the sacred peninsula. That way is forbidden to any but the oracles, though I myself walked upon it once by permission when the goddess led us to shelter from the flood. That way was sealed after the rain's end, and not even Lare knows any longer where to find the door. And the other? The other is the way of the crossing, but it is cursed. How so? Kate, a dark deed brought the curse. I would not name it. I saw those three who tried to cross. The skin of the first broke open where the waters touched him, so that in the end his flesh was one great wound. He not could endure the touch of other flesh, nor the water, nor of clothing, nor of his bed, and even the air against him stung him to misery. So he cast himself from a treetop at last. The second went deaf and speechless, yet he was ever after straining to hear, boring into his ears with sharp sticks to open them. But the only sound that came was as of one choking. A third into the waters only to his waist. His legs shriveled like fruit that drops from the tree and is left to lie in the sun. He pulled himself from place to place with his arms, digging his nails into the dirt. Even now I can nearly not bear the horror of it. Dominic, is it not enough? Soon, Ronnie. Is there then no other way? It is said that the forest pool is fed by the fountain, though its waters have not the same virtue. Yet many among the children have dived deep into it and can find no bottom, and no channel leading north and west. Even could one be found, no man could swim so far without breath. North and west, and the way of the crossing, it has not been tried for these thousands of years? No, Dominic, but night approaches, and Lari comes here soon. We must go from here. Lari may give place to us. We will stay. Ronnie, for what deed was the crossing cursed, and who cursed it? Was it the goddess of whom you speak? Ronnie looked at him bitterly, but she was spared from raking more words dry as dust from her throat, for Lari stepped out from behind, a clump of red ginger to stand before them. Seeing them where they lay impeding the path to the banyan, she turned to leave. She was stopped by Dominic. For what deed was the crossing cursed, Laurie? Laurie's eyes upon Ronnie's were filled with disappointment. She touched the scar on her throat, but said nothing to Dominic's question, and was instantly gone. Dominic tasted the relish of the enormous weight of centuries of secrets ripe for his uncovering. For what does she come here? he asked Ronnie. But Ronnie sat silently shivering, and he saw that he could press her no further for now. It behooved him to wait, if only for a little. For now, Ronnie, it is enough, he said. As gift in kind, what would you know of me? Do you love me, Dominic? Ronnie asked in a dull voice. Dominic's eyes narrowed. Do I? His voice trailed off in a laugh. It is as I thought, droned Ronnie. Then, show me again what is in your sea chest. She moved aside so that he might have access to it. Dominic planted himself before the chest. Dusk came on as he lifted its latch, and a solitary bird lighted among the banyan's branches and began to screech. He raised the lid, expelling a wind hot and suffocating as the simoon of Arabia, which dissipated after a moment. He removed the coat of his uniform that acted as a covering to the chest's treasures. "'What are these?' asked Ronnie, yet not as though she cared, pointing to the tarot cards. A second and a third bird joined their shrieks with the first. They are used to forecast the future. Would you have me read them for you? Ronnie shuddered. No. A dozen birds now screamed in the tree, with more alighting every instant. The air felt overcharged with energy, and was tainted with a mephitic smell, like that of scum floating on the surface of a pool. And this? she asked, touching the heretic's Bible. It is a book of lies, yet one may turn them outside in to reveal the truth. A fork of lightning, followed by no thunder and no rain, rolled dusk backward to day. 
Dominic looked up and saw the light flaming upward from the trunks like St. Elmo's blue fire atop the honor-bound's mast. The banyan swarmed so thickly with feathered life that no twist of a branch remained for more to perch upon, and the caterwauling of it became deafening. Dominic cursed the birds, not able to hear above them what Ronnie asked him next. Instead, he read her lips, and in answer lifted from the chest one fold of the hibiscus net. Beneath this, all things that possess spirit must show their true shape. Crying out suddenly, he pulled his hand away, letting the lid of the chest clap shut, leaving the coat of his uniform outside upon the ground. He pressed his eyes closed and opened them again three times in succession. It seemed to him that his hand beneath the net had appeared not as a hand, but as... With the full falling of night, the birds fell silent in chorus, but he could hear their wings still fanning the air to frenzy overhead. "'Would you wear it for me, Dominic?' asked Ronnie, fingering the coat. "'No, Ronnie, it is a garment of disgrace, and the girdle of your people pleases me much better. "'May I wear it, then?' "'No, it would not be fitting,' then reconsidering. "'Yes, it does not matter.' "'Ronnie put the coat around her shoulders. "'Though the night had not been cold, her shivering ceased. "'What is written upon your vessel?' she asked, "'her voice drifting as though she talked in sleep. "'Its name, the Honor Bound.' What is honor? Honor is... But before he could define it, she asked, What is Marielle? Now it was Dominic's turn to shiver. Damn my dreams to hell, he rasped, clenching his teeth. Then, Marielle is the name of a woman who was mine long ago. Did she bear a child to you? Yes, a bastard. His teeth were beginning to ache with clenching. He wanted to strike Ronnie as hard as he struck Laurie at her prophetic utterance, but he did not wish to so forfeit his control, for he needed all of it now at this tilting point of fate. The color of Ronnie's skirt and shoulder scarf galled him where it showed from beneath his coat as entirely as the bitter blue of Laurie's eyes, scarlet. She bore a child to you, and yet you left her? Yes. Why should the child make a difference? This one among all women he could never love as daughter. Ronnie's voice grew yet more distant, and with it her eyes. I knew a man who thought he cared for children so much that he committed sacrilege to save them, and yet I saw at last that he cared nothing at all. Is it not strange how our hearts deceive us? She did not wait for Dominic to reply, but, her tone changing suddenly, said, There is nothing you can teach me, Dominic, for your heart is empty as far inward as I can reach, empty as is my own. Yet it may be that you can make me forget how empty for a while. Make a game for me, Dominic. Make me laugh. For I feel now that I may never laugh again. The request was odd. And at first Dominic was at a loss, for he had been wont to neglect play amid the discipline of his magic and the labor of his seeking. Yet at last he asked, Do you like to swing, Ronnie? I do not know what this is. A swing is a rope or vine that is knotted into a loop and suspended from a tree. One sits within the loop and moves one's legs or is pushed back and forth to lift one high. Natives of the other islands have them, and the people of the land from which I come. Then make me a swing. Dominic searched out the banyan for a strong vine, but could find none sufficient. So leaving Ronnie to wait, he walked to the ship's boat and fetched a coil of line. Returning with it, he fashioned a swing for her and hung it from the banyan's lowest branch, which he reached only by standing upon his chest. He lifted Ronnie into the swing and began to push her, higher and higher, until laughter burst from her perforce, and even he could not keep his mirth under. Look, Dominic, she said, pointing up, how the banyan dances as partner to the moon shadows. Dominic looked and saw how, indeed, the bending of the branches seemed to be mirrored in dark ripples upon the moon's surface. He knew the legend of banyan forests upon the moon, but had never perceived that any earthbound tree matched the fluctuations of lunar light. Ronnie now swung nearly level with the banyan's top, and her laughter sounded almost like a scream. No more, she called down breathlessly, and he helped her to slow gradually till she swung but low and gently. Now she was no longer laughing, but the tears summoned by her laughter's intensity glistened like sugar icing upon her skin. Dominic, may I ask you one thing more? What is it? I ask that, before you seek to find the fountain, you will speak with Laurie of the goddess and hear what she will tell you. I do not care for what Laurie may tell me. Only speak with her, and then do what you will. 
Very well, Ronnie. I will speak with her. Thank you, Dominic. She looked past him again to the gibbous face of the moon, and her brow furrowed. A shadow across the moon, Dominic. It is strange. Her voice hinted at nerves frayed to the edge of madness, but there was no fear in it. Dominic stared upward to the night lamp of heaven, to where the umbra of a swinging rope moved to and fro. Catching hold of the noose in which Ranny sat with the coat of his uniform draped about her, he stopped the swing, hugging her to himself. Chapter 18 A Messenger in Desolation He fell upon his knees before it, overcome by its beauty. The breadth and depth of the universe danced in every drop, and drop with drop linking danced eternally, chained within its sacramental flow. The motion of it moved him to weeping, and its color, his heart broke with the sheer blueness of it, and he could never again desire anything but that it ever break and break while he knelt here till the end of time and beyond. It was the fountain of life, and he, Brian David, beheld it in the flesh, face to face. The music of it exalted him beyond his loftiest dreams. The light of it reduced him to littleness, and joy was his both ways. Here is heaven, he thought but could not remember having died. He looked to have his mother meet him soon, but he was content whether she came or no. Kneeling before the fountain, he let it erode him to his elements and rebuild him layer by layer, without mistakes, lost in blue and quested for and found there again. Presently, from behind its pure transparency, showed a human form, smiling. He raised his eyes and inquired, Mother? His smile altered its cast. No, it was not she but another that he loved, also welcome as were all pilgrims to this place. Not his mother, but... I am Dominic, intoned the other. Brian's smile lapsed. For his captain to assert his selfhood before the source of selves, he must still be without comprehension of what it was. Will he never give his blindness over, thought Brian impatiently? Then he thought to wonder how impatience or an unregenerate soul had come to be in heaven. Then he wondered whether indeed this were heaven, but only, I am Dominic, Captain repeated, taking up the smile that Brian had let fall. Brian shivered to see how it hung upon his face, its angle queer and its fixity unnatural. Faced with it, the fountain seemed to flow slower and dimmer. You are nearly nothing, Captain, Brian countered, more nearly all the time. But kneel here next to me and you might be... I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and end, croaked Dominic, and began to laugh. Brian felt faint at this blasphemy, and at the laughter whose horror was somehow even greater. He felt suddenly sick, as though he must vomit the horror out. Then Dominic reached into his sea chest, which had stood at his side, unnoticed by Brian until now, and pulled its contents from it, abomination by abomination, and threw them into the water. No, cried Brian, you are defiling it. But the captain continued heedless to toss scorpion after flailing scorpion into the fountain. I have been deceived, wept Brian. This must be hell. No, Dominic, no, he cried once more. But already the waters had begun to turn red as the fire of Lucifer, as Christ's bleeding, as... No, Dominic, no, 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 he murmured, the waters failing in his vision but their sound remaining. He felt a gentle hand upon his cheek. Mother, bless all the saints that you have come at last. He opened his eyes and looked hazily into the eyes of Lare, and then more clearly beyond them to the blue sky of new morning. He raised his head, flexed his fingers at the ends of his cruciate arms, and sat up. Waves lapsed peacefully against the sea-smooth lava rocks near to where Lare and he had made their bed with the down of thistles for their pillow. He drew a deep breath of the salt-fresh air, and was restored to happiness. "'You were dreaming, Brian David,' said Larry, smiling at him. Brian shuddered. "'Aye, a nightmare. I would not dream that another time. Dominic was... No, I'll not pass the horror along to you. Your shirt is soaked with sweat.' Larry helped him to remove the voyage-worn shirt, rinsed it clean in a tide pool, and laid it out to dry in the sun. Turning back to him, she half knelt beside him, running her fingers tenderly across his back. These scars, Brian David, so many, what made them? My father made most of them when I was a child. I have not looked in a glass for so long I had forgotten that they were there. 
They must have pained you very much when they were new. Brian turned full face to her. His own fingers traced the scar across her throat. My pain is not worth talking of, he said. But this, this hurts still. Since we have plundered your island's purity, it hurts again like it was only just done. Laura's eyes were wet, but her smile was not lessened. Is it not proof of the goodness of Kyalari that with new pain she has brought me new comfort? How lonely beyond all consoling it has been since before ever my scar was made. Kayla lusted so for the glory of the oracles, but never did it enter his thought to consider their isolation. But do not let my sorrows wound you, my comforter, Brian David. I fear that my tale of the past has already burdened you with uneasy dreams. It did come into the dream in a way, all mad and twisted, but I'd not choose to unknow what you have told me no matter. I have never heard a story so sad as though I heard it of the first woman after she was outcast from Eden's garden, or of Cain when he was doomed to wander for murdering his brother. And yet there is a cleanness in what you tell, as though I were hearing of her son's babyhood from the lips of God's own mother. But there are things in your story I wonder at, Lari. In our holy book it tells of the bringing of the flood by the Lord Jehovah, him that you call Kyalari, for I see that it's no heathen thing like Baal or Ashtaroth you worship. But it says in our book that in the rain everything living upon the earth drowned, but for Noah and his family and the animals within the ark. And so it makes me wonder that the women of your people were not drowned like the others. I do not know your book, Brian David, though perhaps you might teach me of it in exchange for my own record of what is true. Yet I think that you do not need to wonder too greatly. It is written, you have said, that all upon the earth drowned, but my sisters and I were not preserved from death anywhere upon the earth's face, but beneath it. And yet it may be that we also died to life as others know it in that rain, though we have endured in our bodies beyond that time. Indeed, the long years have felt to me like death, and life grows yet more shadowed since your landfall, and soon it may be wholly dark. But I make you sad again, and for this I am sorry. Tell me, Brian David, what is it you wear upon your neck? What man is this that hangs so wounded? The crucified one, Jesus, he was called when he was here on earth. The book tells how that God was born into the world as a baby of a girl who was a virgin, and grew to a man and taught the people and did miracles, and was murdered at last because men could not bear to hear the truth, he told them. But it was all as he had planned it, for he died of a purpose so that we could live and become good like him despite the natural badness in us. And he came alive again after three days and went back into heaven to be with his father. For we believe that God is one and three at the same time, though we are not sure how. I expect it was the third part, him they call the Holy Ghost, that made you alive after Kayla killed you. And the book says that at the end of the world Jesus will come to us again and be our king. When did these things happen, Brian David? How many years ago? It will be nearly eighteen centuries now. Eighteen hundred years. And did the sun go dark when this other died? Aye, so the book tells. I remember, whispered Lari. I remember the day that Kyalari died. Once we were so near to her. Then we did not call her she, but a word that told all of her, as she has made us and the others both, and contains us and all else within her. Once we were so near, now we have aged so far away. Kyalari died, and I, her oracle, did not know. You were never far, Lari, not you, not ever. I had thought that my mother must be the closest in goodness to the virgin as any woman born. But you seem as near to me, and when I am by you I feel that I am that near. You have never been other than near, Brian David, and you will be nearer yet. This at least of the shaded future Kyalari permits me to see. Lari paused, then said quietly, Thank you for making me to come away. Do not talk of it, Lari. I have no wonder that you froze with grief. Though I have vowed to the crucified one never to strike a man, if there were ever a man I might take pleasure in beating, it would be... Do not speak of it, Brian David. All will be as it will, and neither we nor he can turn aside the course of the fountain's flow. Come, let us walk together. Lari rose, and Brian with her, tying his now dry shirt about his waist, for the wild wind felt pleasant against his skin. He followed Laurie back over the rocks to the black sand beach, 
and along its seaward fringe the prints of his feet traced a path beside hers, his toes luxuriating in the coolness of the wet sand, till at length they reached a forcible end at a narrow ledge that was the island's southmost tip. Brian stood looking out to sea, feeling as though he looked off the edge of the world. Waves slapped hard against the ledge as they impacted it, and a column of water sprayed fountain-like through a blowhole further ahead where the ledge was too narrow to walk. Laurie, he said in agony of shyness, yet deeming that he must speak. Laurie, I would feel it the best honor I might have if I could be Tane, what we call husband, to you, if you needed me to be so, and asked me to be. I'd feel it an honor, but I know that you will say that I am not he that is meant, and I know that I am not. I know that your heart is already given, but I thought it might be comfort to you to know that a man thinks of you as more worthy of love than any other. Thank you, Brian David. It comforts me truly. You are right to know that it cannot be, but I will not forget your love with which you honor me, but will carry it with me through the dread of the nightland and the light beyond. Then she led him back north and westward through the wind-shimmered grasses and wind-sped furies of golden down and wind-thrawn trees until they came to the foot of the cone. Scorpions stirred their pincers from under rock shadows, but Lari walked the dust among them without fear, and Brian knew that he need have no fear while he walked with her. Up the eastern face of the cone they climbed, through masses of sweet, fragrant honeysuckle and angel's trumpets. Near the top, Brian paused to gaze back away toward the lagoon. See her there where she's anchored, Lari, the honor-bound? Mercy how I love her. It was God's mercy that bore me away in her. I feel at times as though she had a spirit of her own, a sad spirit, for her mariners have made a mockery of her name and turned her from her duty and done cruel deeds on the shores to which she brought them. But now, lying there so with your reef enclosing her, she seems at peace, as though she had found her own meaning at last. How you return the spirit's clear sight to me, Brian David, the wooden lady. I have seen her before, once in a vision long ago. Laurie took his hand, and they continued on to the rim of the cone. Together they cast their eyes downward into its womb of flame. The lake of fire, muttered Brian, or maybe God's glory seen by those who have got no eyes. Brian David? And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, Brian remembered, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. I cannot imagine a world as beautiful without the sea, can you, Laurie? And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful and unbelieving, and the abominable, and murderers, and whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars, shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. What words of joy and fear are in your book, Brian David? And now I hear that your people know also of the fountain of life. We baptize our children in holy water too, though the life it gives is not as with you, but only in their spirits. Even Dominic felt that water upon him once, though he has nearly scourged all the mark of it away by now. I fear for him, Laurie. I do not fear any more for Clement, for like the honor bound, he has found his peace. But Dominic and his sorceries, fire and brimstone. For all his wickedness, I love him, Laurie, for he saved me from death, and my purpose is bound to him. I know it again every time I read the words over that my mother wrote to me as she lay passing from this world. If I could, I would offer myself to the fire in Dominic's place. But the crucified one did that already, and Dominic despised the favor, as he despises your pure, wise love that might save him if anything could. Man that is in honor and understandeth not is like the beasts that perish. I thank the Lord that made me that he made me simple-minded and plain. Dominic's mind is a curse to him, and his beauty in the eyes of women is a plague. Yet for all his great gifts he is a fool. 
cleaving to a woman not his, like King David cleaved to Bathsheba. If he knew that story, he would know that the child David begot of her died, the first child, that is, for King Solomon was the second, and God blessed him. If Ronnie should see another child die, I think she will not bear the burden of it living. So, Thus you judge too ill of her. I believe that her sin in this is but a little. For Kayla killed her heart long ago, and Dominic is hardly more kind. I have sought to help her, but though she honors me, I remind her of her shame, and how much more now than before Dominic's coming. It may be that there is no lasting healing for her, but in the hands of Kailari beyond death. But look there, by the western shore, there is one for whom I fear that healing has not come. If you think upon my story, you will know his name. Maku, Kayla's brother, said Brian, staring in skin-prickling awe. Then, surveying the desolation that extended from the westward rim of the cone to the sea, he asked, Could we walk there, where the fire followed him, Lare? I feel that there might be a cleansing in it somehow. The dread of what Dominic will do creeps about me so close. I feel it also, Brian David. Alas, that Ronnie has given to him knowledge against my counsel. His hand reaches deep into the shadows of Poe, and who but the goddess can know what it may draw back? Down the charred, flower-naked face of the cone, and along the dry bed of the volcanic ocean that hounded Maku to destruction, Brian traveled with Lari in the safeguard of his arm. Past lava flows that lay hardened in coils like sable rope, frosted over with silver lichen, around lesser cones from which fumed sulfurous gases, and among branchless trunks whose pattern of fire had petrified even as the tree turned to ash, by brackish pools and over carpet of cinder where beetles gnawed through solitary stems of blossoming life, through the desert of Kailari's wrath, they journeyed to meet the bitter monument, bitter as the salt pillar that Lot's wife became, the ghost of Maku where it stood prisoned in a shell of himself that perhaps burned him still. They walked in desolation, finding an inexplicable comfort there, for they were not left to walk it alone. When they came to the shore, Brian said, I was born for a purpose and you are left alive for one, far longer than any of your people have been left living. Maybe our meanings are not for us to know, but we can will to mean them no less, for God promised mine to me through my mother, and Kailari through the shark promised yours. He paused awkwardly, then gently he added, Lari, it may be that Dominic has left his child in you already, whether he willed it or no. Lari looked away at this last and said nothing to it, but she answered, the messenger of the water. So many ages ago it bore me upon its back, and yet its words are not fulfilled. Among what far distant seas must it now roam? But it is here, still in your own lagoon, Lari. It was the shark that opened your reef to the honor bound. The blue eyes of Lari came alight with strange expectation. How well do you swim, Brian David? she asked. Well enough, I believe. My lungs are not wanting for strength, if there are some more graceful. There is a tube of lava made when the crust of a flow cooled to hardness, while a molten stream ran still within. See where it opens there yonder? It reaches to the rocks of hearing just before the crossing. For most of its length its upper part holds air, though there is a stretch where it sinks low and is wholly filled with water. I have not swum through it for many years, five centuries at least, but I desire to do so again. It is the nearest way to the rocks, and I feel I will be wanted there soon. Can you swim with me, Brian David? It may be that it will be hard for you without light, but I have known what it is to be blind, and it does not frighten me. If it is your wake I follow in, Lari, the dark will not seem dim. Fountain word from the corpse of Maku that crossed to the tube's opening over memory trails of ravaging flame. Brian stooped low behind Lari to enter, wading through shallow water, and soon he swam in deep water after her with the lamp of the sun left far behind. He heard her cleaving the water before him, but did not see her, for the darkness was complete and the water cold. He followed in her wake until it seemed to him that he could not remember what light was like, though he suspected that they did not journey far as men count distance who have landmarks to cheer them on their way. After a while his limbs began to feel numb and weak, and his breath came hard, for the air was stale. A dread of being trapped stole over him, a dread that Lara would lose him and that he would be turned around in the blackness, never to find exit nor opening again. This is what it is like to be Dominic, he thought. It is to spring this trap that he strives so fiercely for the secret of power as he misapprehends it. 
God help him, he prayed. Then, feeling his dread drain from him, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Here's where the tube sinks, Brian David, Larry called back to him. Breathe deeply and swim straight. The tube has no more turnings and ends soon. Brian felt his head hitting against the tube's ceiling. He filled his lungs to the utmost of their capacity and submerged himself wholly. He urged himself forward with all the strength in his arms and legs, expending his air as gradually as he could, and yet at length it seemed that his strength was not enough. He began to be confused about which way was forward. His hands could not find the tube's wall to guide him. In another moment, only one, he must relieve the unendurable pressure by letting his lungs fill with wet. Then ahead of him there was a troubling of the water, more than that of a single swimmer. It is death himself come to take me, he thought, and gave himself over. At that moment the water went light around him, and he saw a color beyond black and a sunlit surface one final thrust above his head. Taking new charge of himself, even in the instant he resigned it, he propelled himself upward, broke through the air, and breathed. His chest heaving in exquisite pain, he dragged himself onto the shore before the rocks of hearing. Little by little, as his strength returned to him, he sensed a presence overrunning with mysterious power, a presence he recognized, though he could not recall from where or when. He raised his head from the sand. Just seaward from him, up to her waist in the tide, stood Lare, and around her, swimming in slow circles, was the blue shark. Her hand was held out stilly before her, and the fish arched its back to let her stroke it as it passed by and by. Rousing himself to his feet, Brian walked into the waves beside her, holding out his own hand also. The shark encompassed the two of them in figure eights, gazing deep into them with eyes deep with purpose, and though it did not speak, Brian knew that it might if it chose. Turning to look at Lare, Brian saw in her face the same duality that flooded his, fear and trembling, trembling and joy. Now is the hour of meaning, Brian David, she said. It is the beginning of what is to be for you and for me and for all upon the island that are meant. Then from the face of the rocks of hearing that looked toward the rainforest, Brian heard the voice of Dominic crying out Lare's name. Chapter 19 Her Majesty In praise of Kyalare must I sing, Laud I will the wellspring of the waters, Crowning my heart's fire anointed king, To blaze the most high queen among her daughters. In honor of the warrior lord I serve, As squire my battle hymn shall I intone, for he is lavished love without reserve, to arm my will to yield to beauty's throne. Power with pity, grace with truth, have warred beneath their sundered banners to prolong the wounded centuries, now by faith's accord they wed upon one peak. So sounds my song to bless the truth of her and him in me, his might resolved within her majesty. <laughs> In praise of Kyalare must I sing, Lord, I will the wellspring of the waters, Crowning my heart's fire anointed king, To blaze the most high queen among her daughters. In honor of the warrior lord I serve as squire, my battle him shall I intone, for he hath lavished love without reserve, to arm my will to yield to beauty's throne. Power with pity, grace with truth have warred beneath their sundered banners to prolong the wounded centuries now by earth's accord they wed upon one peak so sounds my song to bless the truce of her and him in me his might resolved within her majesty From the central peak of the Pali, no region of the island was beyond the eye's reach, though the secrets of the sacred peninsula were wrapped ever in mystifying veils. Upon that peak he had made his camp these three days past, descending only to bathe and seek food, then ascending once more. 
Within the ring of ruins he reclined or lay, sat cross-legged or stood gazing afar, sometimes singing, sometimes silent hours long, with Nika above or beneath him or beside, but always connected, always held at the point of touch by the resolution of her story in his and his and hers. That he might remain here unceasingly was his passionate wish, that he might never have reason to upset this balance between the past to which his back was turned and the future into which he must step, creating it as he went. Yet God's man that he was, he understood that the stillness of knowing that he is he is a stillness in motion, that only in act can love impress itself into the everlasting. Knowing this, yet regretting the knowledge amid his perfect content, Clement stood scanning the horizon, waiting for a sign that would tip the balance forward. He might stay with Nika upon the island till both of them shed their bodies like mourning garments when joy has returned. He might bring up children with her in the fear of both their visions of deity. But more than this was required of him, and he must neither chafe at its delay nor fail to be alert. He could not, like his captain, rush headlong into the torrential flow of deed, but could move only as he was carried, and though the spirit upon whose tide he floated was slow, yet it was too quick for his liking. Nika longed to breathe a life into history. He longed for destiny to hold its breath for always, but he knew that it was only sleeping. And so his eyes traveled patiently over the landscape of potentiality, and acting in love, Nika waited with him, and the dreaming breast of the island rose and fell softly and evenly, until at last with a cold-water shock he spied tokens of waking. He clasped the hand of Nika more tightly in his, that the moment might be engraved in his senses lastingly. Nika, look where the rocks of hearing draw near to the crossing, and tell me what you see. I see lights, Clement, strange lights upon the sea. Do they belong to the island's own secrets? Have you seen them before, and do you know their meaning? I have never seen them. Then, in the moment after, Clement, she whispered fearfully, and pressed herself against him. Then Clement, leaping without hesitancy into the heart of her fear, saw yet more clearly the pale, silent flashes that lit the waves, the windless turbulence that made the water upheave, saw how the clouds bore down upon the rocks like a suffocating pillow upon the face of an unloved mate. The rainforest grew too thick and near to the rocks to reveal if any tarried there, whether woman or man, but rising through the trees to the falling ceiling of sky were streamers of luminous smoke, sickly green. It is as when the long rain came, as I have seen it in my dreams, shivered Nika. Must we drown so soon with our shared history and its beginnings? No, Nika, it is not the coming of the rain, but something else, something other. Following the fear to its limit, he was led into truth. He turned to face her. I must go down from here quickly. Will you come with me, my courageous one? My faith requires your sustenance to face what I must face, do what I must do. I will come, Clement, though I am afraid. But if not the horror of the rain, what horror is it? It is Dominic. Three days have I awaited the lifting of his hand, and now at last it is he. Then swiftly they left the ruined ring, and climbed from ledge to downward ledge alongside the thunder of the waterfall. Then speedily they put the hills and streams behind them, and flung their lithe bodies into the surf, hugging the shoreline northward to the lagoon. Then in haste, stopping only to drink, they traversed the rainforest, and emerged from it through choking green billows at the eastward face of the rocks of hearing, just before the crossing. For all their haste, and the urgency that fueled it, it had taken them two full hours and part of a third to come so far. They emerged from the forest at the rocks to the sight of Brian and Ronnie, Laurie and Dominic, seemingly frozen. Ronnie stood furthest from the rocks, in the grip of some helpless terror. Halfway between her and the rocks stood Brian, the strokes of an internal battle raging across his face. Just before the rocks stood Dominic and Laurie near enough to feel one another's breath, and Laurie's fingers were pressed to her scar and it was bleeding. The squire of the Lord of Hosts and his queen bride stepped from the trees into this icy tableau, just in time to see the ice break, just as Brian came unnumbed to take three paces forward and marry his fist to the cheekbone of Dominic. Lare came the cry, and again, Lare. At the sound of Dominic's voice, the messenger of the water swam one final lap around them to whom it had been sent, and departed from them. Laurie turned to face the rocks of hearing. I am summoned, she said simply, and walked toward a cutting in the rocks that was a natural stair. Brian followed behind, wondering at what Dominic's summons portended. 
Why in the name of cruelty should he seek her out, he thought, that he has not cast a caring glance her way since the night he lay with her, but I've no doubt that he will make his reasons known too soon. Trailing Laurie to the foot of the stair, Brian heard around him the murmuring of voices he could not quite catch meaning from, though what reached to him from meaning's fringes was charged with sweetness, yet not without pain. Laurie said nothing to dissuade him, but he sensed that the steps she now began to ascend were not for his treading. Instead, he skirted the rocks north for what little length of them remained, and rounded them on the side of the rainforest. There he saw Dominic in the native garb of his adoption, and Ronnie a little way forestward, at his back, her hands folded limply, her eyes cast down. Like a poor slave from some sultan's harem, Brian thought. He acknowledged with tenderness the shamed glance she turned toward him, and would disgust the preoccupied glance of Dominic. Even as Dominic, stepping closer to the rocks, widened the breach between himself and his lover, Brian drew nearer to her, yet not so near as to discomfort her. Then he crossed his arms against the prickling wind of his foreboding, and waited to see how it would end. Dominic stood at the foot of the rock's east-facing stair, looking up. There was no need for him to send forth his cry another time, for he sensed the imminent advent of the one he had summoned. In another moment he saw her, flaring up like a beacon upon the topmost step which East shared with West, her eyes bluer and more rarefied than heaven's breathing, blue as the whole weight of the sea, and more deep. Dominic lifted his hands as a priest lifts them before the altar, but the gesture was laden with condescension, as was his voice when he said, As a seeker of the knowledge you hold, I salute you, oracle of the fountain. Will you not come down, that your bounty and my lack might encounter more nearly? He felt Brian's eyes upon him bristling at the arrogance of his feigned humility, but the eyes of Lare betrayed no offense. She descended the stairs at his word, until at last she faced him closely on level ground. Despite his rejection of her as concubine, he was impressed by her bearing, for he had looked to see that meeting his gaze should cause her to wince or blush, with shame or with hate. She did neither of these things, though he sensed emotion in her only mastered by a discipline of spirit complete as his. Her words might have been spoken to any seeker of her wisdom. I am the fountain's oracle. What would you know of me? For myself I would know nothing, but my woman bids me hear from your lips something of the power you profess to serve, one Kyalari, if I have the name aright. And as my search has much to do with unseen powers as they act visibly, I have consented to listen and to weigh what you say as it has use for me. So then, Lari, tell me of your goddess, and of why my purpose should acknowledge her. Tell me first, Dominic, what is it you seek? I seek the fountain. For what purpose? I seek its life, that I may live. That is well. I seek its spirit, that I might breathe it into myself. That also is well. Then set me on the path that leads to it. I cannot. Then you are not its oracle. If you are learned in your profession, a millennia-old curse would not bar you from it and hidden doors cannot long remain so to the bidding of an adept. I myself have learned many means to find the path, but in respect for your office I have come to you first. Will you help me or hinder me, Lari? If you will not help, for your own sake do not hinder, but only stand aside while I work my own work. I will not hinder you, for the path lies too far from you for my hindrance to matter. I cannot help you, for though the curse were lifted and the door rediscovered, to walk those roads would lead you away from what you seek." Yes, Dominic, away. So I tell you by the authority of the goddess, which I will not justify to you if you will not acknowledge it as just. Alas, that in all your seeking you have faced the wrong way, and only you know the distance you have come that you might trace it back again. Dominic shifted his footing and lightly tossed his head in impatience. This fulfilling of his promise to Ronnie was becoming wearisome, for it was clear that it served his purpose not at all. Bemuse me with no parables, Laurie, for I am not of those that have eyes but cannot see. I have the strength to imbibe the truth straight, if truth I know it to be. I have sought life's secret for thirteen years, and the fountain holds that secret, and the fountain is upon this island. How then is my way erred? The truth is that you should not have come here. You should never have forsaken the nation of your birth. At your birth you knew the waters of life, but you have left them far behind. I perceive that you have spoken with Brian, you may spare yourself breath, for the piety of oppression finds no meek hearer in me. If this is all you have to give me, our speech may end here. Is this all, Oracle of the Fountain? 
Is there nothing of your Kyalari, no proof of her potency, that you can bring to bear? I bring nothing to bear, Dominic. But she scatters signs of herself abroad as she chooses. Can it be that her works have given you no proof in all your years? No, Lari, but power is revealed to us as we the beholders choose. I need no god to make my meaning for me, for I make my own. Yea, I am my own meaning. Yet I am able, as many are not, to summon forces beyond myself to my aid and to make their force mine. Have not the spirits of many among the dead confessed to me, telling truth mingled with lies that I must sift with a careful hand? Have I not summoned the blue shark, servant of the gods of your own people, and it has been commanded by my word? Have not the hearts of a multitude, women and men, inclined to my will as I will that they should? Yea, have not you yourself come to me now, even as I called? The messenger of the water, Dominic, when have you summoned it? Eight times in all, at the first six it appeared soon afterward, whether I pronounced the word upon land or on my ship's deck, yet its vital energies must now be waxing dim. For I summoned it yet a seventh time when I entered again into the waters of Polynesia not long before our landfall, and I repeated the word a quarter of an hour past as I stood at the crossing, but it has not come. Then Dominic saw that, all unwittingly, he had said something to shake Laurie to her foundations. You have summoned the shark, and it has not come? It has not come? Truly the goddess shows me her hand in a way I cannot understand. She fell silent for a moment, then continued more steadily. When you summoned it, and you say that it did appear, did it speak to you? Yes, many things, Dominic lied, a part of him regretting the departure from Verity the other recognizing the expediency of giving his antagonist an answer that made her uneasy. But the shark that plays messenger to the island gods plays no part in my present concern, for I have come to the home of the fountain of life without it. Again I ask you, Lari, is this all you will speak to me, and must I now work alone? Will you not listen to the voice of your power for me at these rocks? Then Ronnie has told you also of the rocks of hearing, and with what bitter word did you impose upon her will to hear? But yes, Dominic, I will listen for you, though I warn you that to those who choose to sift their truths too finely, the rocks may choose to be silent. Then Lari turned to the rocks and laid her body against them. Dominic heard a faint whispering that crescendoed slowly to a cataract of sound, and in among it were voices, or perhaps only one, that seemed familiar to him, though he could not tell where he had known it before. He watched how the limbs of Lari quivered as the voices possessed her, as conduit to their revelations and his eyes glittered with that peculiar lust that all practitioners of magic know. He wondered if he had not dismissed her in favor of her weaker sister too soon, for surely in her the incubus of the secret had left many a seed, though she had smothered them in the swaddling bands of a passive conscience and turned their masculine force effeminate. He wondered if he might not yet make some use of her. The voices trickled away, releasing Lari to turn back to him. Her face was drawn, and she seemed unwilling to speak. Speak, oracle of Kyalari, said Dominic. Were the rocks mute, or what says she to me, an almsbearer at her gate? She says, replied Lari softly, that as you approached her as a seeker of truth, she made haste to speak to you, even on your first night upon her island. She says that it would be long before you hear her voice again, for when she spoke to you, you struck her into silence, which she only now breaks to you that you may know the reason of what is to come that in sooth it has been summoned of you by your own hand. Then the spirit of warfare rose up in Dominic, but there was no heat in it, only a calm acceptance of the gauntlet she had flung to him as he perceived it. He breathed deeply to ready himself for what he meant to do, looking into Lari's eyes all the while. He rolled the taste of their blueness around upon his tongue, and he hearkened toward the sucking of their strength into his own, already mighty. It would not come quickly, and he was glad, for the trophy of her conquered majesty was worth a struggle of many moments. He might have issued a formal challenge of one adept to another, but he suspected that she would refuse it. And so he said merely, I will show you my hand, Lari. And he reached behind to his pigtail and slowly unbound his hair. As his fingers began the unweaving, he had a wayward wish, fleeting instantly as it came, to draw her head downward and crown it with a kiss like an angel's teardrop falling from on high. Then the white flag that held his assault in check was lowered, and gazing still into the eyes of his enemies, he began the spell. Lari felt the force of the wave he directed surge toward her, knowing that it was already too late to turn it back. She did nothing to brace herself against it, but only committed herself to the mysteries of the goddess that moved within it. 
Her speech with Dominic had been fraught with pain, but since being visited once more by the messenger of the water, her sense of a meaning surely coming, surely coming with or without her participation, cradled all things, including her hurt, in its hand. She thought of Dominic and the shark, and how the will of Kyalari worked even through his willfulness, of how generously she came at his bidding because she herself had bidden herself through him. Then her thoughts began to drift, for the tide that rolled from his darkling eyes lifted her off her feet. Had she known the story of Samson, she might have perceived the significance of his letting down his hair, symbolic unsheathing of power, inviting her to do the same. Not knowing, yet the act worked in her strangely, for with his hair unbound, the resemblance of Dominic to Kayla was wrenchingly, terribly strong. Nearly, very near, Larry thought as the tide began to carry her. And yet, it was not a difference of the flesh, though Dominic stood only half a head above her where Kayla had towered far over her. The voice, though drawing closer to the difference, did not contain it, though in Dominic the resonance of Kayla gave way to a childlike hesitancy, belying the authority of his eyes. Very near, yet still far enough, but then she could consider it no more, for the hands that held her aloft, hers yet not her own, slipped from their mooring of foam and were pulled under. The wave ran far over her head, yet even in its depths, and there especially the waters of the fountain were merged with it into the extinction of her fear. Soon she was drowned, but she sought no exit from Dominic's eyes, but only knew him, knew him utterly as he could not know her now and might never, knew him moment by moment, and for all moments, for whatever purpose was purposed. She realized vaguely that the elements of air, water, and fire were aroused by that knowing. She sensed distantly that the eyes of others looked on their intimacy and saw something else, that Dominic himself saw her burial in him as a struggle for life, her yielding as resistance. She sensed that time, and time passed, though she could make no measure of its passing. At last, with curious reluctance, she rose without striving to the surface again. Yet she could not begin again to breathe, for she had been immersed for too long. Then a breach opened in her to aid her, and she felt the breath pour into it. And she beheld Dominic once more from the outside of him, and felt a wetness and a stinging at her throat. Putting her fingers to it, she found that her scar had broken apart, and that it bled and the gift of her blood to him was as the gift of her maidenhead had he cared for it when it was his, though she knew that he had summoned it forth only to prove his supremacy and to make her cry. From the few steps' distant vantage at which he had watched their exchange, Brian had alternately despaired at the pride of Dominic and hoped wildly for its melting in Larry's love. He had not understood what the rocks had spoken through her, yet he sensed that Dominic understood perfectly and had been pierced to the heart. But extracting that deadly shaft as though it were a harmless splinter, Dominic had unbraided his hair, and then, ram's locking horns matched too equally, the altercation began, and Brian bore witness to the most strange spectacle of his full young life. Neither Larry moved nor his captain, but only stood drinking in each other's gaze, while the time flowed into an hour, two hours, on toward three. Spiraling outward from them as center, Nature thrashed like a beached fish in its air-drowning throes, eldritch lights emanating from their dueling, orbs to dance upon the waves, and the waves stretched to thin peaks and hung in suspense for minutes on end before crashing down. The sky was muffled in the wool of slaughtered lambs, falling like snow through the fingers that sheared and butchered till his lungs were sore with breathing it. Green smoke, glowing like foxfire, coiled around the sorcerer captain and his archangelic adversary and lengthened to snake among the green of the forest. Then, when Brian thought he would swoon with his awe and Ronnie with her fear, amid the lowering sky above Dominic and Larry, he saw other forms, ghostly and huge, the form of a warrior before all others in prowess, and a queen above all queens in regality. The queen, though in her hand hid an invisible weapon, did not reveal it, but bowed beneath the warrior's fury until she lay at his feet, and the warrior placed his foot upon her neck and lifted his own bloody weapon high. Brian cried out for grief, and yet it seemed to him, even in his grief, that the victory was the queen's, though whether her majesty were that of the fountain's oracle or a queen higher still, he could not be sure. Then the ghostly giants were before his eyes no longer, and the elements rested from their uproarious bacchanal. Laurie stood facing Dominic, looking into his eyes, and he into hers, and her throat was bleeding, and her fingers touched her blood as though it were a thing she had never felt. Though he could not interpret all that he had seen, Brian understood simply what Dominic had done. 
With a cry, he took three steps forward, his fist hardening to a scourge of iron at his side. Then he stopped, swaying in the contrary headwinds of two visions of right. To beat a man, one must hate him, if only for that moment. Then God told Noah to do justice in the earth, blood paying for blood. Lunging through the paradox across the three steps that remained, Brian struck Dominic with all his force upon the cheek. Blood appeared where his blow had opened the skin. The flesh beneath bruised deeply to the bone, blackened. Dominic's eyes upon him were a confusion of injured shock and moonstruck laughter. "'Look to your faith, Brian,' he said mistily. "'You have broken your vow.' Brian stared at his own bruised hand as though it were an instrument of the vilest heresy or the most exacting righteousness, unendurable either way. Dropping to his knees, he began in utter helplessness to weep. Blind with tears, he felt the arms of Lare go around him, stroking his hair while he sobbed into her skirt. He heard her say quietly, but with immeasurable insistence, "'Go away, Dominic. Go away.' By a breeze of movement brushing past him, he knew that Dominic had obeyed. Clement knew as he witnessed the departure that a thing of gravity had transpired, the mere conclusion of which he had arrived to glimpse, whose significance he could only guess. Leaving Nika, he strode to Dominic, where he moved away, and took him by the arm. "'What has happened here, Dominic?' he asked sternly. "'Was it you that made her bleed?' Dominic's eyes were wild with a disturbance that might have been madness, but was not and coupled with a wildness was a weariness unto death. Think what you will of me, Clement, he breathed haltingly, lifting from side to side like a storm-battered ship. I know what I do. Weakly but not defeated, he wove off into the trees. More is the pity, Captain, friend, answered Clement to his back. If you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you say, I see, therefore your sin remains. Chapter 20 crossing to black. On the morning of the day after, Clement and Nika, Brian, Ronnie, and Larry met in the place of jubilation to break their fast together. Their speech was confined to the necessities of courtesy, for a burden of expected tragedy, expected and not to be refused, was upon their tongues. The bond between them was as a bond between all lovers of one that lies dying, or between those who in a common cause are preparing to face death. Dominic had gone away from them at dusk, departing from the rocks as Larry had bidden him, and they had seen nor heard signs of his proximity since. Brian and Clement had thought to go in search of him, but Larry had known their search would be in vain, as Dominic chose not to be found. There being no other action they might take but to pray, and then hope for his welfare, they had eaten and slept and loved one another as they could. But all the while Dominic and his state was the point of gravitation around which their thoughts revolved. Having quenched the hunger ushered in by the long night, they rested from their meat. Then, as in a dream that carries the dreamer forward nearly apart from his volition, Brian took the hand of Ronnie. After a moment Ronnie reached to take Nika's hand, and Nika took Clement's, and Clement's Laurie's. Thus they sat stilly for a time, only looking from eye to eye, without words but for one, from the lips of Lari, which was, wait. They waited while the sun journeyed from the east toward noon and crossed the threshold of the west. The only sound they heard was the running of the waters of life. The only sound was the fountains, until from the west and north there sounded a scream, nearly beyond the bounds of humanity in its desolation. Not my eyes! By the five wounds of Christ, not my eyes! The hearts of those who waited in the place leapt in their throats and perished there. The scream, which was Dominic's, re-echoed in the tombs of their breasts long after it sank to silence. Then each of the others in turn bestirred themselves to look to Lare, and she, tears dropping like myrrh to solve her newly worsened scar, said, Go to him, Clement, at the crossing. Go as his chaplain, though the words of comfort you offer will be too hard for him. And after Clement, you, Brian David, go as a cherished son to him, and take Nika with you to join her husband. Ronnie, go to him last as his lover, and feed him with the strength of your embrace. Clement, weeping, released her hand and rose up to lead in doing her bidding. You do not come with us, Lari? Lari clasped his hand briefly again. Dominic and I may never more meet, except he will come to me.